Sorry, I'm not yeah. sure. Oh, okay. Now we're live. Yeah. Now we're live. You can go ahead, Scott. Sure. Good morning. We're here live with Blue Talks Amplify Your Message, and I am thrilled to be co-hosting. My name is Scott McDermott, and I'm here with the lovely and amazing and talented Miss Laura Lake. Thank you. Oh, you want me to introduce myself? Sure. <laughs> that sounds great. So I'm Laura Lake, and yeah, I'm I'm very excited to be here with Scott. I think we have some great synergy, some new faces to this Blue Talks Amplify Your Message event. And I hope that the conversations that we have today really highlight the intentions behind our business so that we are not those best kept secrets and we are sharing that message and amplifying that message in any and all ways that we can. So I want to welcome our special guest, Patrick Verano. Is that how you say your name? Uh, it's actually Verano. Close. Verano? Very close. Okay. So yeah, it's not one of those easy names that people usually... Uh, uh, it depends on the right. person. That's why I ask. <laughs> So, so really good, good to have you with us. Yeah, looking forward to being here. It's uh, uh, something, obviously, we're we're talking about it, you know, amplifying messages that we all have, and I'm looking forward to being able to do that on this on this format. Well, let's That's start excellent. by you telling us a little bit about you. Yeah, so let's see. I am uh, I'm Patrick Verano, obviously. Uh, I run a company called Emory Leadership Group, and I also host a podcast called Learning from Leaders and. Uh, really, my business is all about trying to work with organizations to develop better leaders, develop better teams, and and really bridge what I would say the gap is or the divide is between um, employee disengagement and organizational excellence. Ooh. Yeah. I had a very quick glance at your website before all of my tech issues <laughs> before the show, and I noticed that there was a story in there about your leadership and how you lost a bunch of employees within the first six months. I, I did. Yeah. I want to hear about that. Yeah. So, um, it is a story that I will often tell of 22 years old. I right have my four year degree. I think I know it all. I, I join a large organization that has a management training program. I go through six months of training and then I'm asked to, um, take on a store down in, in the Cape in Massachusetts um, that is a, is a problem store. The uh, staff is not very good there. And uh, here I go, right? I, I've got all my tools. I know what I'm doing. I go down there and uh, things changed. Things, uh, there was an impact that I made. And I will tell you, theft went up while I was there. Um, half of my staff quit while I was there. I learned very quickly that my my education and my certifications and and all of those things meant nothing because I really didn't understand at that point how important it was to create relationships with people. That was the problem. And certainly the theft that went up, it's not to say that those employees were were stealing from me, um, but it, it goes off of a lot of the the work that we look at around Gallup and and disengagement that even if they weren't stealing, they weren't aware of what was going on in the store or cared enough to watch what was going on. And it allowed other people probably to come in and, and, uh, take what they wanted. Cause I can promise you it was a shoe store. I didn't, I didn't leave there with, <laughs> with a whole host of, uh, of different shoes. Aww. So that's my story. Um, it was a great learning lesson at 22 years old. Um, I learned quickly that that was, uh, I, I ended up leaving and going into sales from that point, but I learned quickly at that point that, uh, this is not how you, this is not how you get the best out of people. It was a great learning experience for me. It changed how I, uh, how I did everything really going forward or tried to. That's powerful. It's huge. I mean, I have the experience as well, Patrick, of running my own business for 18 years with, with between 20 and 30 staff and you know, what you teach and what you help with is just massive. Yeah. Because it's huge. I mean, they call it HR, human resources, which sounds fascinating to me, but it's about creating a team that works together and understands that if you steal or allow things to be stolen, stolen, you're harming, you're literally biting the hand that feeds you, but yeah. people don't always get that. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, the, the term HR human resources, um, I, I, I'd like to see that changed. It, although there is, a, there's a very important part to that is that to me, it's about human relationships. That's the HR human yes. relationships. Yes. Right? When you create that, it's a different environment. Um, exactly. and, and leading 
it's a relationship. It's a bridge that we build. It is a bridge that we build. And, and when we behave in the right ways, it gets stronger. We can do, it's not about being soft on people or, um, you know, it's got to be one, one way or another. It's, you can have both mm-hmm. when, when you develop strong relationships. And that's really what I focus on. Patrick, what would you say, because in my experience, and hopefully this is helpful, um, because I know you gift people with so much knowledge in this respect, but consider this. There's a line that I worked with when I was running my own company where you want to be family and friends in a sense with your staff because it matters that you're a team, but there has to be a point where you're a wonderful person and I like hanging around with you and we're, we're good together and I'm your boss. Yeah. And, and there are things that just have to happen. Yeah. 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 What do you, what, what can you add to that context? Cause there's a, there, that's a quagmire, I think. Right. It's a dance. It really is a dance. Um, I would say what, what I tend to see, especially for newer managers is it, it goes too far in the direction of, we can't have any connection here, right? There's gotta be no personal, um, connection, right? It's, it's sort of, we've got to separate these. And I would, I would argue that we, we don't, we need more connection. We're, we're pack animals, if you think about it. And, and to me, there is, there's a way that we can develop um, strong relationships with people that they feel as though they're, they're valued, right? It's not just, I'm not just there to perform a job for you. And that's the only thing you care about. It's, that I care about you and your development and, and who you are as an individual. And let's face it, not everybody wants to show up at your house for dinner over the weekend, right? They like their own space too. Yeah. And there's, there really is a balance that we can have there. And those are some of the things that you bring up a great point, Scott. Those are some of the things that I go through with new managers of, of um, being able to develop that, um, that ability to have that, that connection, but also the distance. There was an interesting article that just, uh, it was in the, the, the Portland news about a week ago, and it was talking about the great resignation, right? We've all heard about the number of people leaving their jobs in record numbers in the U S and I think in November and October, it was around four and a half million people in each month. And this article talked about it from the standpoint of what was creating this great resignation. And, and this researcher suggested that it was around respect that, this is this is what was causing this. It's not to say that money or other things weren't the excuses people were using, but that when people don't feel as though they are respected in an organization, those things become more prominent, right? Not only am I not respected here, but I'm not making good money here either. Now, I would argue that this idea of the great resignation going on, to me, it's the only thing that's accurate about that is that people are actually leaving organizations now over the last year. The great resignation from my experience uh, of being in this over a decade and certainly my experience in in working in organizations, great resignation has been going on for a long time. Mentally and emotionally, people have left their organizations. It's just that now over the last three or four months, physically, they are deciding to go other places. But they've been, they've been gone for a long time. And, and a lot of the work around Gallup would would validate that. That's why, you know, Gallup research data hasn't changed really in probably almost two decades that about a third of employees are engaged and about two thirds are disengaged. Mm -hmm. And about 70% of that engagement is a reflection of who you report to. Yeah. Behaviors. We're into behaviors now. Treat people the right way. They will, they will follow you where you want to go. And we can all think of probably that person that we worked for somewhere in our career, hopefully we were lucky enough to have that person that you would have done anything for that person. Right. And why (laughs) I'd I'd ask the two of you, what was it about that person that you were like, I'm going where you're asking me to go. They actually cared about me as a human being, not the roles that I filled for them or the needs that I filled for them. This is where my, my definition of business plays a huge part into everything we were just discussing. Yeah. My definition is not just about the transactions. We are human beings serving other human beings to be the human beings that they want to become. Yeah. What that looks like in different industries and businesses is different. But now we're starting to bring that humanity back into the transactional businesses that we used to have. 
Yeah, so I'm, without, I'm loving this conversation. Without question. Scott, yeah. on your on your board there, you should be doing the ding, 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 ding. Right? I, was gonna, I wanted to, but I didn't want to interrupt. I was like, <laughs> yeah, right, I, right, I, right. That, but I didn't want to interrupt. But I'm 100% with you. And you, you say that question about, you know, think of a boss that, that was a leader versus the boss. And I've, I've had both examples. One of my first bosses, Dan, when I got out of architecture college and was my first job, he was phenomenal like he was a, a father figure to me in some yeah. ways um he was a caring and amazing and helpful and and helped me with things beyond the workspace um you know my father passed away when i was 17 so there was kind of a gap there in a sense i suppose but one of the best pieces of advice i ever got in those young years was from my boss dan and i was comfortable enough with him he created a place where i was comfortable enough that i looked at him as a mentor not just my boss. And I remember saying, Dan, you know, if you're my age, you're, you're, you're 19 years old and you're just starting out, what would you do differently? Now, I guess I'm smart enough. I asked that question, but he said, I would buy a house immediately. Stop wasting your money on rent. And I took that advice and I scraped everything and did all the things. And I bought a house and it's been the best decision I've ever made in my life. Now, conversely, later in life, I had a boss that believed to be the boss Everyone, everyone must hate you and fear you. You have to keep them under your thumb yeah. and watch everything they do because those little suckers are trying to cheat you and rob you. And you got to watch everything they do. And he used to stay late after work and rifle through our desks and read what we were working on. And it was a horrible existence. Mm -hmm. and everybody couldn't wait to quit. Yeah. And, and just those two were, and Dan, my first boss, we would do and I, I worked weekends. I worked late. I didn't even file the overtime. Yeah, I did matter. everything I could for him. Yeah. Cause you knew, you knew when you needed something, you were going to get it back. Yeah. There's no question about it. And those people, yeah. and I've, I've had, I've had both as well. And I always tried to be a Dan boss, right? Yeah. Not a, not a George boss. I tried yeah. to be a Dan boss. And I mean, there's lots of examples. I want to touch on one thing, which I find is, is fascinating too. So especially for any new bosses out there or entrepreneurs that struggle with this building a team world. I remember one of my personal trainers. So I, I quit my architecture career and I built a gym. That's a whole story, but um, we get to talk later today, Laura, I'll cover that. But yeah. <laughs> one of my trainers was, was late coming to work one day and he'd been late a couple of times kind of thing. And it would have been easy to go, Hey, you're late. Bleh. But I kind of was like, well, why are you late again? And it was his car having car troubles again and i said oh what happened and we had covered for him fine but so what happens is oh, i got a flat tire again like i'm so sick of this da, 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 da. he was a brand new trainer just starting out didn't have a big client load yet and so i was like okay cool and i went out into the parking lot and i looked at his car and and these tires on this thing i think calling them tires was a stretch i mean you can see the wire ply i mean they were they were I would have thrown them out a hundred thousand miles ago. So I went across the street to the tire shop and I went to the owner and we had a good relationship because our, our businesses were next to each other kind of thing. And I just said, Hey, what can you do for four tires for my, for my, like, can you replace this one tire? He goes, ah, we, they mismatch. Let's replace all four tires. I say, great. What look, look in, I'm going to do this. He doesn't need to know what can we do to get him some tires? I don't have a budget, but what can we do? And the tire store guy was phenomenal. He had four matching tires that were used, but still really good. Wow. And while my employee was working, they changed out his tires. Wow. I didn't even say anything. Wow. We just did that. Right. And he figured it out. Right. He came and gave me the biggest hug. Now, <clears throat> my question is to me, that's, a, that's, that's the boss mentality that I had, like be that mentor guy. And I want to hear your thoughts on this. Sometimes, even though you do those things, that boss will, that, that employee will burn you, hurt you and stuff you over. Yeah. And to my mind, you do those nice things anyway. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so there's what we call a vulnerability, right? You, Brené Brown's probably one of the most prominent over the last 10 years or so of bringing that to the forefront. Uh, and to me, it's, it's a no brainer in regards to vulnerability being important. And, and one, of, one part of vulnerability is you take a risk on things, right? You just put it out there that you might get burned on this. Yeah. Um, now, when I talk about vulnerability, I 
I like to challenge people to amp it up even another notch in what I call intentional vulnerability. That means not only do I, I accept that I'm going to have to be a vulnerable, I'm looking for opportunities where I can flex that muscle of vulnerability, where it might be, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer here. Um, I'm struggling. Um, I'm sorry, whatever that might be as a leader, when I am intentionally vulnerable, it's letting people know that I'm not afraid to, to say I don't have the answers here. Now, with a caveat, I say that the flip side of this is I don't want somebody coming in every day who is supposed to be the leader saying, oh, messed up again. I don't know where we're going today either, right? I'm, I'm not going to have a lot of confidence following this person, but I, I do need to know that this is in that leader's wheelhouse, that this is this is something they are capable of doing that when they don't have the answer, they're not afraid to say, I don't have the answer. Or when they screw up, they can say, uh, you know what, um, Laura, the other day when I called you out on that, that was my bad. I shouldn't have done that. And I'm sorry for that. Right. <laughs> Got to be able to do that. goes a long way. Um, when I do that, I, so this model that I use called cables is yeah, based on six behaviors. So mm -hmm. the last behavior is around specifics, which is about clear expectations. And getting back to this original question about how do you, as a manager, um, have a relationship, but also have boundaries. To me, it's around clear expectations. Mm -hmm. That I think the biggest fear that people have or managers, if they're too nice to their employees, is what? Doormat. They're going to get taken advantage of, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you become a doormat. Right. Um, and I would argue that when you have clear expectations, you, that is to me sort of the checks and balances of kindness that we're going to have some boundaries here in terms of what's acceptable and what is acceptable. Um, no more than with my kids. I, I look at this cables model that, that I use and, and it, it's as effective with any of my relationships with my wife, with my kids, because clear expectations with them is that, you know, my oldest son, who's now 24, um, I, I, I consider him one of my best friends, right? Now that said, we also have a very clear understanding that I'm not his best friend first. I'm his dad first. So um, when he was going through high school, I wasn't doing things to try and be his best friend. I was his dad. Yeah. But that didn't take away from um, us being able to have a really great relationship. And the same thing, my youngest is 15. My daughter is 17. We're going through the same things. I'm very close with them but there are clear expectations, right? And when we have those, it allows us to not feel as though we're gonna be taken advantage of. Um, you know, one of the things, Scott, that as you talked about your two bosses, because in, in the work that, that I do, I think we spend so much time in leadership development looking at how to lead other people. We don't do the step first that needs to be done is how do we lead ourselves? <laughs> we don't lead ourselves the right way. And if I'm not happy with who I am inside, if I'm not uh, comfortable in my own skin, how am I going to lead anybody else? I can't. Yes. You can't do it. Right? And, and that's often what I see. So the, the two examples that you gave of the person that had to go around and micromanage and I've got my thumb on everybody, that says more about that individual and how they feel about themselves than, than it does about the people that are around them. No more than myself. When, yeah. when I had that first leadership role, it was, I wasn't happy where I am or, or was. So it was, I, I got the, the, the strategies and techniques and I'm going to tell you guys how you're going to do this job. doesn't fly. Yeah, doesn't that's, one, that, that's one of these right here. <laughs> yeah. Right. There we go. That's definitely a dinger, that one. I remember having two bosses back doing retail. And if you've ever worked retail, I know you. You just said that, Patrick. Yeah. You can get all different sorts of managers. I had one manager who every morning you'd come in, you'd have your staff meeting. They're like, you do this, you do that, you do that. And they they just delegated and told you what to do. Then I had another manager who would work mornings once a week. And she would say, here's what needs to be done. Um, is there anything else that you feel is a priority right now. It's like, whoa, yes, I now have a voice. And I'm like, okay, I understand there's a sale in toys, but there's like nothing on the floor. Everything is fine. Whereas linens, there's fitted sheets everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I could fold fitted sheets. I learned because of the retail job trying to shove them back in. Oh my Wait, God. That's possible? <laughs> yeah, that's yes, possible. I even taught my daughter. I thought you just kind of roll them up. You don't roll them. It doesn't work. You can teach a course. It, yeah, it only takes like 30 seconds. It's all good. You can, <laughs> but you having can my other manager, just the whole day went so smooth. Because yeah. you knew at any point, if you needed to, you could go, hey, this is how I'm feeling. This is what I see going on. Is this okay? And she'd be like, okay, I get that. Not right now. Please do this. Or yes, please go and do that. Whatever it was that you had. Mm, that's awesome. Oh, we got a frozen internet on Laura. That's okay. We can. She's in the middle of a snowstorm. Uh, her kids are home for really? a day. So she um, really warned me. Hi. <laughs> she's literally frozen. Yeah. Up and, uh, <laughs> I'm good. I'm back. That was it. I was just really appreciative of yeah. that, that manager. It, it, it makes a huge difference. So you, one of the things that you hit on there is autonomy. Um, and if you look at work by um, Dan Pink wrote a great book called Mo um, Drive and what motivates people. And it talks about three different things in, in their research that is, uh, is, is motivating. And one of them is when people feel as though they have autonomy. The other is purpose, mm -hmm. right? What am I doing? why am i doing this and and the third is around development is do i feel like i've got room to grow here those are important things but autonomy is is vital i think in terms of um engaging people right and as a leader um there's humility there that i need to have in terms of i don't have all the answers here and and you probably know better than i do i i will say that in in the two plus decades that I spent in the pharmaceutical industry, a lot of that time was spent as a follower. And what I mean by that is that I, I was part of a team. I didn't have anybody that, that reported to me. And it was probably the best thing that could have happened to me in terms of understanding what was important leading other people, because you don't lead people if you don't have followers, right? You're not leading anybody. So if you think about it in terms of leadership development, Think about a product that would sell, right? Well, I might think that this product is, has, these features are the most important part of this product. Everything about this, this is what I love about this product I created. Well, who gets to decide if those really are the most important things? Me or the people that are going to buy the things? Mm -hmm. It's the customer. So if you, if you apply that same logic to leadership development, we spend so much time in leadership development thinking about what's important as a leader as opposed to thinking what do followers want, right? Because if we think of what followers want and what they need, then we create a product called a leader that delivers on what the customer wants, right? Isn't it? I mean, it, <laughs> yeah. I can think that this is, this is what leadership means. This is what's important. Well, that's great. You can think that all day long, but if people don't want to follow you, then that's not what's important to them. Might be what's important to you, but it's not about you. It's about the people that you're going to ask to, to, to say yes to the request you're going to make. Huge difference. That is huge. I got a couple of questions for you, Patrick. Um, and and one really cycles around to you know other than obviously working with yourself and hiring you as a coach, uh, you know, to help you. Are there books that you consider to be? of paramount importance if you want to be a leader of people. And, and, and I want to, I want to seed this for a second because I know you've mentioned drive. I've read tons of books uh, as, because I think that's a piece too. If you're a leader, you need to be a student of leadership Yeah, because you have to learn. Now, one of the books that I read uh, is called the great game of business. And, and have you heard that? Have you read that book? Not, no. Oh, fascinating. No. Um, really interesting book. The great game of business. It, it's, Stems from down, the manufacturing always, side. What's that? I said I'm writing it down though because I'm always that, yeah. Stems from learnings from a manufacturing side of things, but the the leadership skills in the great game of business are are massive. And because I want to ask you this question. So so first question is any books you recommend. Second is when you say what do followers want, and I think of employees. I can tell you what most of them want, and and it's maybe not what they actually want. It's what they think they want. I want to get paid more money. I need more money. I want more money. So, which do they don't. I mean, they do, but they don't. That's not one of the main drivers. So, right? Because yeah. they need to realize that. And oh gosh, I know this interviewing you, but I can share these stories. I had a trainer, phenomenal trainer, 
just his gift to be a trainer. And I, I, I brought him, I coached him when he was in football and he was high school. And then I brought him up. I was like, you'd make a good trainer when he was in college. He didn't like what he was doing. Made him a trainer. It was great. It was a phenomenal trainer for a year or two, but a lot of his clients, big, rich oil field guys. And they're like, you're it. You're a smart guy. You're a capable guy. Like, what? How much does Scott pay you? Come on, how much does he pay you? And and he would say, Oh no, I'm good. I love it working here. Scott's great. I love working here. Ah, come on, how much does he pay you? <laughs> and eventually, he got the one guy's like, I'll triple it, and I'll give you a company vehicle. And he was like, twenty nothing years old. And he comes to me in tears. He says, I said Aww. yes to this guy, and I'm like, Dude, you got to go. What? You got to go. You're 20 nothing years old. You want to buy a house. That guy's offering you triple the money and a vehicle and a visa card and then daily out allowance. Like I can't match that. But I said, I will say this. I can tell you right now, you're not going to love that job. You're not. You're gifted at what you're doing right now. So just keep me in mind. And if you realize you don't love that job and you realize the money's not enough, you always come back to me. And I'll tell you what, three years later, he did. Yeah. Three years later, he came back and yeah. he is still a trainer today. He now runs his own gym and he's loving it. So, yeah. so there's that piece. Now I've dovetailed off, but so books you recommend. And, and I think we've covered a little bit about, yeah. you know, it's not the money. It's right. love the job. So tell me. So along those lines, I'm going to piggyback off of that because uh, in the book that I am, will be published in about uh, eight weeks, it's called lead like no other lead, like no other lead, like no other. And uh, it, the subtitle of it is, is how to bridge the divide between employee disengagement and organizational excellence. And what's interesting is that lead like no other is not the, the intention that I'm the only one that can be at the top. Lead like no other is really about how do you find your own groove, right? How do you lead like no other? Because we're all unique, but that doesn't mean that we can't all um, be successful at this in different ways it, with our own personalities. Um, so my my story first on that though, is because this this manager is in is in the book, First manager I had in the pharmaceutical industry when he hired me, um, and his name's Eddie Epps, a great guy. I'm still friends with him today. Is he always said to me, if a recruiter calls you, you owe it to yourself and your family to listen to what they have to say, mm -hmm. that there might be a better offer. Now, if you think about it, right? I mean, that is, he knew that if I left, that was going to be a hole that was going to make more work for him to have to fill. But what was he thinking about himself? or the person that worked for him. He was in my corner, which made me want to be more in his corner constantly. Yeah. Now, compare that with when I left the industry, um, I, had a, um, I had a manager that um, I was asked to do some work after hours to, um, on, on a very short notice to attend an after hours function. And I said, I, I couldn't do it because I had a daughter who I believe at that point it was a, a track event. I was either basketball or track. I, I lose track of our, uh, of our sporting events at this point. But the, the purpose of it was um, he became very irritated with me and said, if you want to move within this company um, and, and, and become a leader, you're going to have to sacrifice your family at times to do that. Best thing he could have said for me to me at that point, because that was one of my highest values. And I knew that this was not a place that I was going to be able to, to thrive and do what I wanted to do. And I was gone shortly after that. Now that said, I probably would have been fired, but I, I was gone shortly after that. Um, because that just, that just went against, um, really such a strong value that I had. It wasn't a fit. That's powerful. Yeah. Um, so in regards to books, it, I I'm interesting in that I, I pull from a bunch of different places. And also my background in, in the pharmaceutical industry is a lot of it was around research. So I spent a lot of my time, um, looking at studies on influence, um, habit formation, resilience, because to me, they're all different components of, um, of how we lead. So, um, I can't think of. Uh, any books in particular off, off the top of my head as I look over, but um, books on emotional intelligence, I think, are, are worthwhile reads. Um, there is a, book, a good book, um, and the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab this one because I always... <laughs> I love when I could actually physically see the book. I, yeah. Um, Leadership and Self-Deception. You got to hold it up. A great Read book. Oh, yeah. Show us the book. 
<laughs> there it is. Leadership and Self-Deception. So it's by the Arbinger Institute. Great book um, that, that I highly recommend in terms of, of how we tell our stories about what they call in the box versus outside the box um, leadership. Um, I spend a lot of my time in influence. So um, any books around um, influence by Robert Cialdini is somebody that that um, I actually enjoy. Um, he has one book called Influence that I, I think is really is really a good book. There's another book um, also that's called Influencer. Um, do I have that one up there? Influencer. Hmm. I, oh, yes, I do. This one's a great one. <laughs> That's one of the things I miss. My new podcast studio doesn't have my bookshelves. They're in a different office. Oh, Influencer. Oh, good. New science of leading change. Yeah. Sorry, the new science. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So those are those are a couple. I, I do a lot of uh, reading in the Stoics as well. I love the Stoics. I think uh, oh, from a standpoint right? of, yeah, there's a great book um, that I listen to probably twice a year, and it's called The Practicing Stoic, and okay. it was written by uh, a gentleman named Ward Farnsworth. Um, that I, I, to me, I would highly recommend that book. What's the title again? Um, the practicing stoic. You're going to, you're going to force me to sort of reach. Over. No, that's okay. <laughs> One of my favorites on that is by Ryan holiday called the obstacle is the way. Yeah. This, this to me is, and I've read that one as well. This to me is, is, is money. And you can see how many times I've got like, yeah. you know, dog ears and everything else in this. And I, I have most of these on audio. And I will listen, I will listen to them probably once a quarter. Totally. That's the great thing about audiobooks. I can listen to them at 1.5 speed while I'm doing something else. Yes. Well, you know what I find too is after you listen to it once, I, I'll jack it up to two because I've already got the basics. I just want to I want to refresh on the whole thing. So a four hour book, you finish in two hours. Yeah. Yeah. I um we just did a project around the house here. We built a little addition. Well, it's fairly big actually. To anyway, it doesn't matter. But I was roofing it, and I listened to Will Smith's audio autobiography the whole time I built this thing. Yeah, I actually have to get that. I've heard that's really good. It's really good. Yeah, yeah. and and you know, one of my key philosophies as a as a team leader, as a boss, as a and all that it was ABL. Always be learning. Yeah, <sighs> always be learning. So because, leaders are learners. Yeah, you leaders need to, are learners. That's, yeah. that's the tag on my podcast. Leaders are learned. Yeah. There's no chance you know everything. There's no right. chance. <laughs> well, you just have and, to make it over that hump of, oh, we think we're learning. We think we're learning. We're almost there. And then as soon as you peak the crest of that, you're like, oh, there's yeah. all of this other stuff I knew nothing about. And yeah. you realize, right. huh. <laughs> so there are, there are two quotes that I find myself using more and more, even in today. One is by Epictetus. So speaking of the Stoics, yep. it says it's impossible to learn what one thinks they already know, right? It's yes. impossible to learn what one thinks they already know. And I will start out a lot of my workshops with that because what I want to try and do is, is open people up to the idea that you came here thinking, you know, this stuff. And I, I promise you, you don't. And, and if you do, you've lost because there's always something I'm reading. I read more now than I did when I was going through my graduate program in leadership because I know that it's always changing. There's always something that we can do to improve. Um, one of the other quotes is by um, an American philosopher who was, I think, in like the 1950s named Eric Hoffer. And he said, in times of change, learners inherit the earth while the learned will find themselves perfectly suited for a world that no longer exists. No longer exists right? That no longer exists. And, and we are in that place right now. I've used that quote for a decade now. And if you, unless you have been under a rock, right, right. For two years, then the world is different. And, and those people that think they're going to lead and manage the way they did prior to this, you're going to be left holding the bag. It's, yeah. It just doesn't, it, the world doesn't roll that way anymore. We, we have a society right now, a percentage of society that are applying all of the things that were true a while ago to this paradigm and they're not true in this paradigm no. at all. Question. Yeah. It's Without fascinating. Question, the game has changed. Yeah. Right. And, and That's I don't even know so much. It, it is the game has changed. It's that, that the people just aren't willing to tolerate the same stuff they, they had tolerated for years, not doing there's, it anymore. There's so many layers to it. Yeah. Like I use, I remember thinking that 
back as a kid watching Star Trek and the future and when there was the international communication, everything was just easy. And I thought, boy, when we have access to all the information, life is going to be so much better. And it's worse. It's way worse because you can't, people can't dissect fact from fiction anymore because fiction can look really good and fact can look not good. And yeah. that critical thinking element is. Yeah. Um, uh, so if you, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd love to, when we think about what we're doing is we're building bridges. That's the, the best way that I can think of this. When we have relationships, we're building bridges. So um, an example that I will often use is the Golden Gate Bridge. People are very familiar with the Golden Gate Bridge. If you look at that bridge, that main tower or that main cable that runs tower to tower is about three feet in diameter, but it's made up of about 27,000 individual cables that are, they're, they're bundled in about 60 bundles. To me, this is no different than our relation in, than our behaviors and the relationships we have is that the more we behave in positive ways, the more cables we add, the stronger this bridge becomes that we travel every day so that we're always going to make mistakes. There are going to be times that we're going to be selfish. We're going to do the wrong things. But if we've, if we've built enough cables long enough, this bridge is going to be strong enough to withstand that stress that's put on it. Just like the Golden Gate Bridge. If I cut a hundred of those cables, they'll need to be repaired, but nothing else. That bridge is not going to collapse but it's continually maintained, right? Which is the other thing is that we continually have to be building these relationships that, that we have. So with that, what I did was I created cables, which is, uh, an acronym for these six behaviors yeah. the first one being congruence that if we are not in a place where we walk the talk, what we say and what we do is, is not in alignment. We will start to erode that relationship bridge. Right. And we can all think of people that we've been around that they, you know, they tell us to do one thing, but they don't do it themselves. Yep. And again, you think about this from any relationship, whether it's at work or at home, my, my 15 year old who's learning to drive right now, um, I can't tell him to, you know, be responsible when he's driving. If when we're in the car together, I'm looking at my phone as I'm going down the highway at, at you know, 65, 70 miles an hour doesn't work. Right. It's in, he's going to say, you're full of it. You know, don't lecture me on safety when you don't do it yourself. Yeah. That's to me, one of the foundations. So the next one we move on to is around appreciation. That's the next cable that we build. And that's about recognition. And it's about recognizing people, not only for who they are, but for what they do. So the first part, when we recognize people for who they are, that's about uh, appreciating diversity in other people, right? We all come with different experiences and things that we bring to the table when we look for those things, right? When we recognize people for what they do, it's about just recognizing people for, for the effort that they've made. And I think in, in these times, we have had our heads down for so long in terms of just trying to get through and grind through things that I, I do a lot of work in healthcare is that we don't take enough time to say, listen, I want to, you know, last week was really busy. Thank you so much for what X, what you did, right? Took me five seconds to say that it goes a long way. Mm -hmm. So the, the B in the model as we're building this bridge is around belongingness that as leaders, we need to create a sense of inclusion that people need to feel as though they belong to the group. And when we don't feel as though we belong to the group, we either have people that engage in ways that are disruptive to the rest of the group, almost acting out, or we can have other things where people disengage and they sort of just drift into the, into the shadows that they don't want to be part of the organization. Belongingness is huge. And again, one of those things that I think, um, if I look at the environment that we're in right now, I think the isolation that we have experienced, um, has pulled from our ability to feel connected with other people other than people that are just like ourselves, which is a problem in and of itself for a number of reasons, right? So then we move on to the next cable that we build is around listening. And that's um, about listening in four different ways though. We listen with our ears, right? Tone of voice, the words somebody uses, the pace that they speak at. When we listen with our ears, we listen looking with our eyes. Um, I'm sorry, when we listen with our eyes, we we watch what people do, right? It's facial expressions, body language. Those things are so important, you know? So when I talk about other books that I, I read in these areas, one that stands out is a book by a guy named Joe Navarro. 
he was an FBI uh, interrogator and he wrote a book called What Every Body Is Saying. And what he did was he cataloged in 20 years of research what he was seeing, what they called tells in other people. We have what's called an autonomic nervous system mm -hmm. that when we're uncomfortable, we do things that we're not even aware that we do. I, I, it might be me scratching my face when, when I'm, I'm uncomfortable on a question I get asked or I'm nervous about something. We all have them. The better I am at understanding and reading other people's tells, right? The better listener I'm going to be. So the next one is around listening with our mind and that's about curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. When somebody says something, what do they really mean? Is this, is what they said and what they mean the same thing? And the last one is listening with our heart or listening with empathy. And that's about if this person were talking or I was talking to them, how would I want them to be listening to me? Right. And when you think about it, when you activate all four of those, it's very difficult to not be focused on the other person, not ourselves. So in, in a lot of the work that I have had over the last sort of decade, we talk about listening, listening to understand versus listening to respond, right? We want to listen to understand. And we hear people, you know, listen to respond is I please stop talking so that I can, I can give my counter argument, right? I would, I would suggest that that has devolved even more over the last two years that not only is it, we don't listen or we listen to respond. We now listen to undermine, right? Now I'm just going to tell you how stupid you are. You're selfish, you're racist, you're right. Whatever it might be, right? <laughs> whatever that is, right? We don't listen to understand. Now we listen to undermine. Mm -hmm. So empathy is the next uh, cable that we build. And that again is to me about what's it like to be the other person, right? To imagine as a leader, what was it like when I first came in this organization? When I was being talked to about corrective actions, how would I want to be, how would I want to be treated? And then the last one is, is around specifics and that's clear expectations. That's the S in the cables model. And that's about making sure that we understand what we need from each other is, is what I need and what I'm receiving the same thing. And when we have those things, we build the the best bridge I believe we can in terms of building relationships. And and the more we do it, the stronger this thing becomes. That's fantastic. Yeah. So cables is yep. congruence, appreciation, belonging, listening, empathy, and specifics. Boy, I tell you, that's yeah. a bridge not coming down. Yeah. <laughs> no, that is definitely one of those highlights of the hour. <laughs> it's a bridge. If we think about it like we're building a bridge. Yes. right? Then these are the cables. This is how this thing gets stronger. And we do this when we consistently work on this, right? It's a, each one of these are like a muscle the, the more we do it, the, the easier it becomes. It becomes automatic. I have this right? visual that I use that links to all of this, where we have all these walls and these boundaries that aren't helpful. So my, my imagery is, okay, when we tear down those walls, each brick is now being used to build a bridge yeah. to whatever we do want. And you have to tear down those walls in order to build that bridge. Yeah. So right. Whatever your, whatever your, your vision is of this again, to me, it's a, it's a chasm in between. You've got, yeah. you've got employees over here and, and organizational excellence over here or um, family over here and, and a fully functional relationship on the other side and, and the bridge to get there is through these behaviors. Mm. That's yeah. awesome. Patrick, we've got less than a minute left. How do people work with you and how would they get in touch with you? Yeah. Um, so well, a couple different ways. One is they can reach out to me through um, my website, Emory Leadership Group. Um, there's a, um, a giveaway on there too, in terms of um, what a power journal that I created that when we talked about leading from the inside first is a great model that helps people around developing resilience and well-being and and five different activities that they can do. Um, so that's one way. Um, the other way is through my personal email, which is Patrick at Emery and it's E M E R Y leadership group.com. You can reach out to me there. Um, you can probably track me down through Facebook or through Twitter. I'm uh, coach Patrick Villas and Victor on Twitter. So those are probably the best ways to get in touch with me. You're on LinkedIn as well. I know. Oh yeah. LinkedIn as well. Excellent. Well, it's been fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. I love this. Yeah. So right, we can do better. We can do better. Right, yeah. As leaders, we can do better.
So absolutely huge opportunities. Well, it's been great. I would assume that Shelly's going to bring the next guest in shortly. I'm not sure on the back end on how that all works, but uh, it's been really fantastic. What a great conversation. Well, I speaking hope- of Star Trek, I think I'm going to get ported out of here, right? Somehow I'm going to get sucked up. In the- right. And there it went. <laughs> Predictably done. <laughs> and here we go. I love it when the back end works seamlessly. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Well, moving right into our next guest, which is really exciting. Uh, Charmaine Hammond, welcome to the Blue Talks Amplify Your Life. Thank you. Looking forward to being here today. That's awesome. It's really good to see you. And I just want to do a shout out and a thank you to uh, to Corey Poirier and his team for, for managing the back end so that yeah. Laura and I could just look pretty and just ask <laughs> questions and just things happen. <laughs> And that's lovely. You're the pretty one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So Charmaine, please, can you introduce yourself? Tell the world a little bit about who you are. Absolutely. Professional speaker. I've been speaking for about 30 years corporately uh, and for government and business on communication, collaboration, and conflict resolution. I also have a second business, which is where Corey knows me very well through, which is Raise a Dream. And at Raise a Dream, we help entrepreneurs, authors, speakers, and coaches raise their dreams and fund their projects through collaboration and sponsorship revenue. Well, that sounds Mm. exciting. Yeah, you got me at sponsorship revenue. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I was on a call last week and they said, Charmaine, lead with that one sentence, <laughs> sponsorship yeah. revenue. Yeah, it's it's a great way for authors and speakers to really um, amplify their message and, and create really meaningful activations and opportunities to partner with brands. And, and when my book came out, my first book about 11 years ago now, which we're still selling, it's in its second edition, we incorporated sponsorship into everything we did around the book launches, the, the book tour. And seven years after it launched, we did a North American book tour, 15,000 kilometers across North America and a sponsored motor home and hotel sponsored for the team and fully sponsored tour. So it's possible. We do it all the time. That's excellent. Yeah, I get questions all the time because People, when they work with coaches, it's not always easy to get a loan or they don't have all the credit cards. So Mm -hmm. one of my suggestions was, hey, you can partner with people and get sponsorships who, when you have this new expertise, you are now shouting their message to the masses as well, not just yours. Exactly. They're like, wait, I could get sponsorships? Yes, absolutely. And it's all about relationships. Mm -hmm. And entrepreneurs tend to work really, really hard at relationships in terms of how they keep their business afloat and how they market. And it really is about strategic relationships. And uh, we have at Raise a Dream, we actually have a seven step model that walks people Mm -hmm. right through how to um, how to secure sponsors. And for a, a movie that I'm an executive producer of, Back Home Again movie, it was funded largely through sponsorship and collaboration and strategic partnerships with brands and companies. Nice. So the Raise Your Dream, I'm curious, where did that name come from? Like, why was it started? Uh, well, Raise a Dream was born out of my business partner and I. Her name is Rebecca. Rebecca Kirstein and I were brainstorming about how we both work with Sponsored. We've been doing this for years individually. And then Rebecca said, you know what, Charmaine, we help people raise a dream. And I thought, oh, that is the name of our collaboration. And the collaboration very quickly became a business. And we've we've now been around for five years and we've helped a lot of authors, speakers, entrepreneurs just really bring their message out by tapping into other people's audiences. And that's where, as you both know, that's so critical to tap into the influence and the communities and the circles that other people have. Otherwise, we're just constantly sending our message out to our own community. And eventually they say, I love you, but enough already. (laughs) Heard you. Been there, there, saw the post, just going to mute you for a while. (laughs) Yes, we don't want that to happen. That's incredible. You know, um, for personal experience, Charmaine, so when I was competing in Ultraman World Triathlon Championships and I was, we were filming it for a documentary, I had all these great ideas. It'd be great. We'll get sponsorships. I mean, I use a Cervelo bike and Aquasphere goggles and an Orca wetsuit and ultra running shoes. And I'm just going to tell those people that I'm doing the World Championships and we're making a documentary. They're just going to throw money at me. And 
And uh, you know what happened out of that? <laughs> Great sound effect. Crickets, nothing, nada. Yeah. There's just no chance they cared at right. all. I know the crickets don't even want to stop. They yeah. will eventually. <laughs> um, I, I was stunned. It was, mm. it was like, yeah, whatever. Like I, most, they didn't even get back to me. And we mm -hmm. did make the documentary and it's an award-winning yeah. film. Brilliant. And zero sponsorship. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just went broke, made it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, oh, oh, I, oh th those stories make me sad because, and, and part of it is, um, and we see this a lot actually, where a lot of authors and entrepreneurs have an amazing project like yours, whether it's a documentary, a book, a, a movement that they're creating. And uh, what I know to be true is that the process really, really matters. And how I learned the process was actually many, many years ago. And I'm talking before I opened my first business in 25, 25 years ago. So when I was still an employee, I actually worked for government and was the sponsor. I had a purse of about $2.5 million that every year, my job was to determine who got that money. The nonprofit organizations that got either sponsorship or grant money or government funding. And I worked in a certain area of the province and was responsible for making those decisions. And there's a lot of competition for small amounts of money. And then I also had the opportunity to be on the other side of the sponsorship table, which was at running nonprofit organizations, having to then ask for the money <laughs> and being able to fund our organization largely through sponsorship dollars, especially when grants had started to kind of uh, dissipate a little bit. So I've sat on those two sides of the sponsorship table. When I opened my business 25 years ago, I took what I learned from those two roles and thought, I'm going to weave sponsorship into everything I do related to my business. So I immediately started working with venue partners and printing partners and media partners right from the get go. And then now I often sponsor projects uh, when it's the right fit. So we've also been on the sponsor side of the uh, uh, the sponsor side and all four sides of those table um, has really helped me understand what what goes into the mind of this sponsor decision maker, because one of the sponsors we work with right now on um, the they uh, the one person I think she said there's 12 of them in their team, but the one person gets about 40 pitches proposals a month and answers up to about 23 phone calls a day of people saying, I've got this tour, I've got this book, I've got this thing, I've got this movie. And so and there's a limited amount of money. And I said, who gets the return call? And she said, well, you did. And I said, well, why did I get the return call? And the other people didn't. And she said, because you didn't pitch me anything. You were purely interested in learning about my business. Your message was, hi, <laughs> I'm really interested in learning more about your brand. I saw that you sponsored this, this, and this, and it had an incredible impact in the community. I'd love to learn more about your priorities and what you're working on in the next year. Didn't mention sponsorship at all. Didn't mention the best project. And I got the call and eventually got the sponsorship. And so that's what's key. When we talk about relationship, it's not only uh, where there's commonality between their brand and what you're doing. It's also building the relationship and learning everything you can about that brand and what matters to them and what they need because sponsorship is a marketing relationship. So at the end of the day, you're marketing their brand in a way that is meaningful for them. For example, when, when we did the motorhome tour, I was, I was telling all these sponsors that we're going to wrap the motorhome and the key sponsors will be on the motorhome. And nearly every sponsor that I talked to about that said, that's awesome. That has zero value to us, though. But it's awesome. Zero value to us. And I said, really? Like hundreds of thousands of people will see it. And she said, when you're driving in a vehicle and you see a motorhome or a truck with logos, do you instantly whip out your cell phone and say, I must get on the website and check out that company? And I said, of course not. And she said, exactly. <laughs> so it gives us awareness. It doesn't help us with our goal, which is connecting people to our product. That's why we have to take time to learn about them. Yeah. That's interesting. You know, Laura, I think I'm going to be in trouble today because so many of the speakers i'm like oh i need to hire them I, 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 I <laughs> no. and i don't have that kind of budget um 
So sponsors. <laughs> I need a sponsor. Um, so curiosity, and and hopefully this appeals to the audience to learn from as well. Uh, you know, in this dialogue. But so we've got this award-winning documentary. So yeah. when I was going to the World Championships, we were we thought let's film the journey of this regular Canadian kid who's not necessarily talented. He's too heavy to be a good triathlete, but he's here anyway. He qualified for the World Championships. Let's film that, and then it was raining and I crashed and cartwheel down the highway at 70 kilometers an hour and almost died. And so then we kept filming and the movie became about something else. It became instead of 2015, the journey of getting to the world championships and crossing the finish line and feeling great. The journey became about three years to rebuild my body and get back to the world championships by hook or by crook wow. and crawl there. <clears throat> and so I didn't get any sponsors really other than I will say performa nutrition did sponsor a little anyway. Um, <laughs> That's the bus that just went by with the logo on it. But now that I'm writing the book that explains all the things that the 82 minute documentary couldn't cover, there's a huge opportunity for sponsorship. Yeah. How do I work with you to do that? Cause I have yeah. no, I, to me, it's just a failure. Nobody cares. You're writing a book. You have a oh. movie. Who cares kid? No, it oh, you and no. 40 people today. So what no. do I do? How do you help? <laughs> no, it's not a failure. And peep the right, Partners will absolutely want to get behind your book. That's the key is to find the right partner. So we do something that's super fun. I'm going to share with all of you how you do this on your own. We call it a needs parade. My business partner, Rebecca, um, introduced me to the model that she had been using for years. And it was the same model I was using. I just didn't have a cool name for it. <laughs> and the needs parade is when you look at, okay, I'm launching this book. Here's what it's about. Here's the intended audience. So you need to know Oh, yeah. fully well who your audience is the real audience not everyone can benefit it from you know who are the top two audiences that are going to love this book and pass it around and share it and then what you do is you ask this question you get with five or six friends or colleagues and um you say i'm going to do a needs parade i need 15 minutes of your time that's it and then you say i'm doing this book here's what it's about here's the audience so you literally speak for about three minutes that's it about your project and then you say who might be a brand a business a company or a collaboration partner that would be a fit and you will be absolutely um blown away by the ideas that will come up and i can pretty much guarantee you most of them would not be the ones that would be on your list because when people don't know everything about you they find ideas um, that that can work. So let me give you an example. I'm going to give you an example from my first book on Toby's Terms, which is a book about my dog. Uh, it's a best-selling book. It's in second edition. It came out in 2011. It was optioned for a movie years ago. We're still still waiting to get it <laughs> to a movie, but um, it, it's got a life. It's an evergreen book. And because it's a dog, we obviously went through the obvious partners. Dog yes. food, you know, what dog food do I use? And yes, our dog food company became one of our partners. They sold our books, they sold them in bulk, they bought bulk copies. But then I start, and then I looked at, um, you know, other brands that we love. Eventually, Petland Canada became one of our partners, hosting events right across Canada for us, selling our books in all of their stores. They even did something that I love. And I'm sharing this story so that you can think broader than we normally think. Petland Canada did this really cool thing where they had Toby's picks. So they asked me to identify the 10 products that I love and Toby loves. And then they went and talked to the brands and we created Toby's picks in the stores. And so on these 10 products, there was a special um, like sign that said Million Acts of Kindness Tour, Toby's face, you know, our logo, the website, and then the price tag for that food. And they even created end dials. And then they had events in their stores and, and they shared our videos. So that was an amazing collaboration. Um, and so another example, and so this is where we get, where we step out of the box. So everyone's thinking, okay, the dog stuff, I get it. That's an obvious fit with a book about a dog. Well, then I started to look at what is everything I'm going to need to promote this book, to go on a tour? Well, I need to have clothing, <laughs> kind of essential, and went to the clothing store and had a clothing sponsor, the clothing store where I shop and had a clothing partner for three years. Then I had a, a makeup and hair sponsor so that whenever I was appearing on media, my makeup was done. I was spo in sponsored clothing. We had travel sponsored. Um, even my eye doctor who doesn't have, you know, he's not 
um, a dog owner at that time, but he bought multiple, multiple copies of my book because he wanted to educate his the children of the parents that he served about eye care in the summer. So he bought a bunch of my books, packaged them up with information about eye care for children and a pair of free sunglasses and gifted those to people. So oh. this is what I'm saying. Like when you are creative, <laughs> the, 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 and that's where I really want you to think about your book that's coming out. Look at the obvious, but then the needs parade can help you just get really um, into the creative thinking. So my first 40 sponsors were all people I knew. My clothing, my hair, my grocery store was a sponsor. Um, the gas station I used to pump up, up at was a sponsor. They were all people I had a relationship with. Even my telecommunications company. Now, do I know Mr. Tellus personally? No, but I've been a client to theirs for many, many years and we found a way to partner together. So you always start with who you know, where you shop and what you love. I just want to take my hairstylist with me just everywhere. <laughs> I don't want anybody else. I'm like, when I travel, can I just put you in my yeah. suitcase? <laughs> I do take my hairstylist with me. <laughs> Love it. My makeup's on point today, isn't it? It's I don't it use is. any, but anyway. <laughs> That's fantastic. Wow. And so um, how, like, I know this is usually my end of interview question, but how can we work with you? But um, <laughs> I, I want to know. I need to write this down. So, <laughs> yeah. so one of the things we have at Raise a Dream, and, I, and I'm going to mention this because of being an author and you've got this book coming if you go on to raiseadream.com, we actually have a free program around um, five ways to increase more book sales. And in that uh, training mm -hmm. program, I in 90 days, so five ways to get more book sales in 90 days. But in there, I talk a little bit about some very innovative, collaborative ways that you can not only sell more books, but start to build sponsor relationships. And then on Raise a Dream, we also work with people individually through what we call power hour calls. This is where we get on calls with authors, speakers, entrepreneurs individually, and just really look at what is the dream they're raising. We create the strategy with them. We give them the tools. So for example, we have an author we're working with right now that is ready to start reaching out to sponsors. So we've worked with the author to create three scripts for the voicemail because chances are you're not gonna get them on the phone first time around. So how do you leave the voicemail that gets returned? Don't email sponsors that, you know, they don't um, typically respond that way. My strategy is um, LinkedIn. That's how I reach out to almost 90% of the sponsors. And interesting, I'm getting the most, uh, Connection request accepted on Friday night, all day Saturday, Saturday evening, and Sunday and Sunday evening. I had three brands that three telecommunication companies on Friday night that I sent a LinkedIn request to just to be connected. And today two of them came through. So these are sponsorship decision makers for telecom communities or communications in Canada. So for some reason, they're checking out LinkedIn on the weekend right now. That's a trend right now. Wow, that is huge. Um, yeah, I, was, I was on LinkedIn for a while and I'm like, this is just too much social media. So I, I dumped <laughs> uh, it for a long time. But then I realized, I'm like, no, the yeah. way that I want to connect with people and the caliber and the, the lifestyle, the mindset yeah. is on LinkedIn. I'm like, why am yeah. I not on LinkedIn? Yes. I picked it up again this week. Yes, so one I, of the I, I, you I love that you're doing that because the sponsorship decision makers they're not hanging out on Facebook. No. If they are, they're on there because of their families and their friends. They're not doing business there. They're not doing business on Twitter. Um, and the hardest thing for sponsor seekers, which is all of us, <laughs> uh, to do is to find the right contact person. This can take. I, it took me nine months in with one sponsor to find the right contact person. And I was getting frustrated and ready to give up. And so I went back into LinkedIn. And, and this is a really big brand that um, we are now in negotiations with <laughs> nine months later. But um, I thought, how am I going to reach them? Like nothing's working. Nobody's responding back. And then I noticed that I am first degree connections with uh, three people. And so I called those three people and said, I see that you're also connected to this individual. I really want to deepen a relationship with that individual. Here's why I was fully transparent. Do you feel comfortable <clears throat> connecting me with them? And two of them said, Charmaine, I don't even know how I met this person. Like, I, I don't even know them. Like, 
not even familiar face, but so I can't really authentically connect you. I said, no problem. The third person said, oh my gosh, I know this person so well. I just had lunch with them yesterday. Can I, can I do an email connect? I was on the phone call with that person two days later. So nine months <laughs> versus two days. And that's why LinkedIn is so powerful because you, and then of course, um, now you're connected with them and then you can look at setting up what we call a discovery call, which is all about getting to know them. I don't mention sponsorship in that um, connection request or in that first opportunity to get on the phone with them. I find those communications tend to go like this. Hi, nice to meet you. Marry me. <laughs> whoa, whoa. I don't remember where I heard that the first time. But I know. You did, you're just you're taken aback immediately yeah. because that's exactly what it feels like. Exactly. Exactly. And there's so much um, LinkedIn marketing <laughs> programs right now where there's that back end system. So here's what I do. I just send a beautifully worded LinkedIn connection request. I say, I love your brand. I read the press release or I saw your video on this. I always mention something that I know about them to show Thank I've you. researched them. <laughs> I also say, oh my gosh, we've got 42 shared connections on LinkedIn. Um, I And, and uh, I'd love to learn more about your brand. Could we stay connected here on LinkedIn? I look forward to following your post, Charmaine. That's it. 80% of them accept the connection. So now... I'm connect. So I chart it that they've accepted the connection. I have a, a Excel chart. And then as soon as they accept, I just say something like, hi there. Thanks so much for accepting the connection request. Look forward to staying in touch and following your posts. Have a great week. Then I, they don't hear from me for like two or three weeks, but it's in my chart and in my calendar to follow up with them. And then I say something like I, again, through LinkedIn, I don't go and find their email. I keep it on LinkedIn. I let them tell me when they're ready to move it to email. And then I just say, um, I'm working on a couple of projects right now. And I would love to get on a, on a call with you to learn more about your brand, some of the marketing opportunities that exist, um, some of your priorities. I use different wording depending on their language because I've researched them a lot before I do this. And uh, basically the gist of that LinkedIn message is, um, I would love to learn more about your brand, your priorities, what you're working on. Um, can we set up a quick discovery call for 20 minutes? And generally you won't get more than 25 to 30 minutes anyway. So I always go shorter and they're like, wow. So instantly what you're doing is you're showing that sponsored decision maker, I understand how this works. Mm -hmm. Even if you're a newbie, you're saying to them, I understand how this works. Because from the first point of contact, you're showing them what you are like to work with as a partner. So if you're not getting back to them, if you've got typos in your messages, if you're way too informal, like, hey, I saw one come to me. Hey, how's it going? And I just thought, oh, that's weird because we don't know each other. And I don't like being greeted with, hey, with an exclamation mark. So instantly, I you know, just deleted that message. I'm not interested in pursuing it. And that's why we want to show them what we're like to work with, because from that moment, they're watching. They're probably going on and checking you out in social before they even get on a call with you. They want to know who you are, how you communicate in the world. Are you negative on social media? Are you bashing things? Are you jumping on the bandwagon? Because if they, if you are, a brand is probably not going to partner with you because they fear that like, you're bringing a lot of negativity to your pages if you're very adversarial adversarial on your pages brands don't want to be a part of that they need to have that trust in the relationship which can bring up a whole other conversation about the whole yeah. no like trust to buy factor which in my mind okay i want to know your your take on this yeah. since we're just talking about it now there's the whole no like buy trust factor which we're all taught to do have people like you have them trust you and then they'll buy where we were just showing that it's the opposite. We have to know our audience. We have to like our audience. We have to learn to trust our audience. Mm -hmm. And that is when they feel comfortable and safe enough to want to reciprocate and do those things for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. How do you feel that plays a role in the work that you do and how you have that communication? Yeah, it's, with sponsorship being all about relationship, uh, it, it, it's, it's huge because if a brand is putting their name to you, 
I mean, th that's amazing. And it could be highly problematic depending on how a person is, is presenting that sponsor and um, knowing the sponsor very well, like sponsorship doesn't, we're working on a couple of very, very large sponsorship right now. And it will probably be between about 12 and 15 meetings that we'll have with them between, you know, this massive sponsorship. But um, that's how we're building relationship. We're finding the synergies. And the thing with sponsorship is that sponsor seekers tend to go there with a pitch. I've got this great book launch. I've got this great whatever. You'd be an awesome sponsor. And their question is, how do you know? Like, what, what did you ask me about my brand? How do you know? And so we always research. I spend about an hour researching a sponsor, minimum, minimum, sometimes up to four hours before I get on a call with them yeah. because it helps me incorporate their language. It helps me know what their values are. I can ask them intelligent questions. I said, oh, recently on a sponsorship call, I said, I noticed that three years ago that you sponsored this type of a, it was some kind of a walkathon. And I said, when I was looking at your company, I'd never seen you do any kind of walkathons before. So would love to learn more about kind of where that shift came. That was really interesting. They said, Hulk, oh, my gosh, <laughs> like, did you ever research? And they said, that was a strategic move. And I said, tell me more. And then they told me why they did that. And I said, is this something you're going to do in future? And they said, no, it was kind of a one-off based on another campaign. But I mean, right there, I probably scored a lot of points because I knew enough about their brand to ask a question. I also knew that the idea I was going to present to them should not be presented now because they just told me that type of activity was not going to be something they're pursuing. So I removed it out of my vocabulary. And this is where that dialogue is important. And all the while you're doing exactly what you just said, you're building that sense of knowing, trusting, modeling what you were like as a brand. So on that discovery call, I, I often don't even talk about what I'm doing until they say, Charmaine, you know, I'm really curious. You've only got five minutes left here on our call today. Um, you obviously reached out to our company. You must be working on some things where you saw some synergy. That's an underlying word. That's what they use, synergy, or a chance for us to amplify each other's efforts. It's another word they use all the time. Um, tell me more. And then I have my project. So in your case, if it's a book, I have that book boiled down into a two to three minute soundbite that I can say, here's what I'm working on. Um, would love to explore if there's some synergies here. I sure heard some as you were talking about your brand, but I would love to continue our dialogue. I have heard right from the start, you using our language language of this show. I was like, oh, she keeps saying amplify and message. It's like, <laughs> he has done right? her research. I'm impressed. Right? So this wow. is why, and thank you for catching that. <laughs> it's how we model, right? If I was on a different conversation, I might not use the word amplify because people might be, what's that? Now in the sponsor world, I will tell you, amplify is a word they use a lot. How can we amplify each other's efforts? How can we help amplify your brand? That is a word, synergy, um, alignment. These are words that are used a lot in the sponsorship calls. And it's super cool that it fits so perfectly with, uh, <laughs> with, this, with this conversation today and your values. And this that's is amazing. Okay. Sorry, I was going to say, this is just amazing stuff. I've got like a whole bunch of notes and things that I can't wait to, to learn more very selfishly. Um, <laughs> no. I do want to, as we get into kind of the final 15 minutes, I really want to make sure we talk a little bit about, you maybe it's a bit old, but your film about the Fort McMurray fires yeah. um, back home again. Yeah. Um, I have so many questions. I'm, I have a nine-year-old that we love movies and everything. And, and I remember, of course, when, when the fires happened and, at our gym, there was our fitness center that I used to own. We had people flooding out of Fort McMurray. And of course, they were finding any port of call. If they had friends in my town of Sylvan Lake, Alberta, they came to stay here. Mm -hmm. And I remember putting a thing out and a bunch of stuff. I said, anybody from Fort McMurray, you work out for free. Come on over. If you uh, need anything, we've got showers, we've got bathrooms, whatever you need on your journey, wherever you're going kind of thing. Because we all got it. Like uh, so many of us did anyway. And then... You built this movie that is just but and and everybody's in it mm -hmm. like i'm floored and fascinated by your process of you got michael j fox tom green eugene levy norm mcdonald howie mandel Catherine o'hara like everybody who's ever been anybody ever in canadian history is in your film 
Like, can you tell us a little bit about that experience? And it, I think it dovetails into your ability to find sponsors and make connections. Totally. Yeah, Please. absolutely. It dovetails. Thank you for asking about that. It is my project of passion and love. Um, I actually lived in Fort McMurray for 16 years and not at the time of the wildfires, but um, years later when the wildfires happened after we had left, I was brought back to the community uh, by a number of my clients, uh, but also by the school divisions and nonprofits to help the community in their recovery and resilience process. I was doing a lot of training and speaking and programming around resilience and facilitating lots of collaborative processes, which is what I do in my other business. And it was there that I met this incredible screenwriter and director, Michael Mankowski is his name. He's a born and raised Fort McMurrayite, an award-winning producer on some of his other previous productions. And he presented to me this, this um, screenplay and it just checked every uh, box that was important to me. It was rooted in collaboration. At, at this point, it was just the screenplay We um, and it's been revised since then. But um, at that point, uh, shortly after the fires, when I met him, um, it, it checked the box of collaboration. It checked the box of doing good for the world. It checked the box of um, inspiring hope and community and connection. So I said yes to get involved, not knowing what that would be. And um, I became the executive producer of the movie. And my role was to secure funding for the movie, secure sponsorship for the movie. This has been created in a very non-traditional way. This is not an investment model movie. We wanted this to be a movie that would support communities, not only in Fort McMurray and around but also around the globe as people struggle with community crisis and as they struggle with mental health issues and community disaster. And when you mentioned all these incredible names, uh, to our knowledge, we have the largest ensemble of award-winning actors in an animated short in history. 19 incredible actors and actresses came on board to be the voice actors for this movie, volunteering and donating their time and voice to the Aww. project, wow. which is incredible. And um, so the, Canadians, like so many Canadians, Canadians. Yeah. absolutely. You know, and I want to give a shout out to the power of relationship, like Tom Green, just an incredible Canadian comedian. He was working with Michael Mankowski, the screenwriter on another project. And when Michael presented this screenplay to him, you know, Tom was excited to be involved. And, and John Schneider, our producer, just an incredible human being, got involved in this project. And, and so Michael and Tom would, or, and John would sort of look at what kind of voice actors, who do we want? Who should the cast be? And Michael would put a name out and John would say something to the effect of, I don't know, Michael, but let me ask. And this is where the power of relationships happens. And that's how we ended up with this incredible, um, incredible cast who were so deeply connected to the conversation of hope, community and mental health. And they voiced the characters in the movie. If you think about um, the movie, it is a 30 minute animated short about the Fort McMurray Wood Buffalo wildfires but told through the voices of the animals who live in the forest. Mm. And it's so beautifully done. So Michael J. Fox, you mentioned him. He is Michael J. Bird in the movie, A Raven. And then we have, um, you mentioned Tom Green and we have Tom Green, he's Mr. O'Malley. We have, um, we also lost two of our cast members um, in the production, Ed Asner, just um, so special and such an icon. And uh, he, he played a really pivotal role. He was the news anchor for mm. PET News and then Norm MacDonald. Lions Bridge. Yes, exactly. And then Norm MacDonald, um, who so beautifully voiced uh, grandpas in the movie. Yeah. And yeah. so we won a few awards at Edmonton International Film Festival and Canada Shorts. And so we're now doing the film festival circuit and a number of private screenings and community screenings. And and then we'll appear at Cinequest in Silicon Valley in uh, April and August. And then the movie will be out there for, for the world after that. That's exciting. Yeah, it's it's amazing to work on. And again, it's rooted in collaboration. We have just incredible partners that are helping us amplify the message, get the movie trailer out to the world, and help us inspire these conversations that are tough for many people to talk about mental health and resilience. And the movie gives people a place to start the conversation by. Hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So I want to know how much you feel collaborations really help with the amplification of anybody's message, whether you are just starting out or you have sponsorship chips. Yeah. <laughs> with you. It's, it's everything uh, for business owners. I mean, how I grew my business, I've now had three businesses in my life. I have a nonprofit charity and all of those are rooted in collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think about sponsorship, it is the end result of a powerful collaboration. You know, sponsorship is not the giving of a check. There's a relationship, a collaborative process that happens for the length of that, um, that project that you're working on. It's everything. And it's really tough for entrepreneurs and speakers, authors, coaches to be able to get their message out into the world in a big way unless we get support from other collaboration partners, whether that's people within our circle and in, in our social community on social media, whether that's friends or family and the natural champions you have, but collaboration is so important because we can achieve together what we can't achieve alone. Totally. That is, that is the biggest truth, isn't it? Because yeah. we have the, the thing that we're good at in our little wheelhouse, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a personal trainer and I, I'm a nutritionist and I coach people how to be super fit and healthy and, and learn about food. Great. I've got this amazing story. I need sponsorships and I need to get into Amazon to be a bestseller and stuff. Well, yeah. I don't know anything about that. And I've, <laughs> I, with the movie, I tried stumbling around blind trying to get sponsorships, but I didn't know what I was doing. I did all the things you said, whatever you do, don't do this. Yeah. I did all those things. Yeah. I, I did them all too, before I learned how to do it right. I mean, just like when I, the very first time I wanted a motor home, this is going back like 11 years when the book first came out. Um, I thought I should go on some kind of tour in a motor home. So the idea actually started in 2010 and I, um, I didn't follow what I knew. I know what not to do. I worked in the, on these sides of the table and I messed up. I pitched a hundred motorhome companies in Alberta when I lived there at the time. And how many, I, I needed that cricket sound that you had because a hundred pitches I sent of a beautiful proposal, zero responded and I was blacklisted. I couldn't even get some of these people on a call later. And I knew better. Yeah. I knew better. And so never, never, never send generic proposals. I, I very rarely, honestly, send proposals. And people say, what? I think like very rarely do I use proposals. I use information packages, but I don't do a proposal unless a sponsor asks for one. Ah. And often we go from conversation to agreement. There isn't a proposal. There's just information they take back to their internal decision makers. And I create that with them. They'll say, can you send me something? Sure. What would you like me to send you? How yeah. long do you want that to be? What should I include? What should I not include? Images? No images. Um, and now, so they essentially help me write what they're going to take forward for approval. Mm. My mind is just blown. <laughs> With all this stuff. Now, earlier you had mentioned a seven-step sponsorship. Sponsorship. Try that again. Yeah. Process. Do you have them named or is it more in-depth? Are you willing to share the basics of that with you us? You betcha. You betcha. And actually on raiseadream.com, right on the homepage, you can download the ebook with the seven steps um, that goes right through detail. But the first step is that we identify and then research our sponsors. We, so we have that needs parade or we start to look at what are the products I use and love or who are the businesses that I think might have some synergy with what I'm doing for my book launch or for my tour or for the, the project I'm working on right now. So we identify and then we research. I go on and start following the brands on social media. I read their press releases, go on their website. I get to know the brand. And sometimes I go, "Ooh, this isn't a fit for me. So I just let it go and then go to the next one. And then after we've identified and researched, then what we've got to do is connect with them. That's where my LinkedIn strategy works. And then what we do, step three, is that discovery call. This is where entrepreneurs, difference makers, <laughs> um, authors, speakers, coaches, this is where they stall out. Because research can be fun and safe. And 
getting a discovery call, right? I know. I could research all day long, every day, <laughs> chat with people all day, every day, but yeah. it's, it's, it's actually taking the action yeah. and that rejection that might come with it. Right. Good. Exactly. So the discovery call is that call where you get on with the brand partner, somebody in the sponsorship or marketing or community investment or public relations or communications department. You're already connected on LinkedIn with them, or you might have found their name somewhere and you've set up a discovery call with them, still having done the research. Discovery calls are generally 20 to 30 minutes. Um, they often will not be on Zoom. They'll often be phone. There's more Zoom over the last couple of years, obviously, or more virtual. And this is a chance to learn all about the brand. And on the Raise a Dream website on our blogs, there are several blogs that give you the discovery questions that we use. So once I get on a call, because there's a tendency for entrepreneurs, hi, how you doing? We get the small talk. And then they say, so I'm working on this book launch. I'm working on this event. They dive right into them. And immediately the sponsor is thinking, oh, God, here we go. Another pitch again. Whereas so if I always say, tell me more about your role. What do, what do you do in your role? And then they're like, oh, wow, they're interested in me. So they tell me what they want me to know about their role. And then I ask a lot of open ended questions. Who, what, where, when, why and how about their brand, about their business, what matters to them? What are their marketing goals? What are their priorities? Who are the audiences they're wanting to get in front of? And then I'm listening for synergy. Oh, they have an audience much like mine. Oh, that's cool. Or they have goals similar to mine. Or I'm thinking my project could help them with that goal. I don't bring any of that up yet. I don't actually talk about me until they invite me to, which is usually in the last 10 minutes of the call. Mm. And then call number one is all about getting call number two. <laughs> That's what we want. And then after discovery call, there's number a number of other calls. And then there might be a proposal. Step number four, there might be a proposal. There may just be a verbal kind of discussion about how we could work together. Then there's generally some kind of a contract or an agreement with my hairdresser. It was an email. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a big formal legal contract with the motorhome. Very big contract developed by both lawyers. And then after the contract, we deliver, we fulfill, we report on that fulfillment. And the last step is that thank you. And we never lose touch with them. Don't be that sponsor seeker that only knocks on the door every year when you're doing something and need money. Aww. You'll burn bridges really quickly. I so, think burn bridges is a big thing you just hit on too. Because yeah. that's where I get analysis paralysis is I feel like there's one shot. Yeah. I'm going to do it wrong and I'm yeah. going to hand grenade this bridge. Yeah. So I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Cause yeah. I don't want to do it wrong. Mm. Right. And I've been like Laura says, I've been the guy, hi, I'm Scott. And I'm, I'm one, I, I like movies and I'm reading a book and I was, and, and I do this and I'm engaging. I'm like, Will you marry me? Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, delete yeah. request. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Cause exactly. Cause they have another 20 other people that are going to do that together. So, and here's, something that one of my sponsors who I've worked with on numerous projects said to me, I said, I always interview my sponsors. So I talk about, you know, what would you like other people to know about sponsorship that are asking? And one of them said, it's just a conversation. It's just a conversation to you, the sponsor seeker. It might be like, I've got to get the sponsorship, but it's just a conversation and they're people. Mm -hmm. They happen to have a job that's in sponsorship. So don't, um, don't create it to be, um, more complex than it is. Just think about it as a dialogue. I'm building a relationship. And in the process, we're going to see if we can work together in some way. Yes. That's we're awesome. dating people before we ask them to marry us. Yes. And today is one of those days for the like <laughs> all the, yes. the proposals today. No. So yeah. we've got a kind of final minute here. Is there mm -hmm. anything you really want people to know or to share? Like, how do they get in touch with you? What do you offer? Like, I imagine to have you coach them if there's a paid for service. How do we, how can you help people? How can people reach you? Absolutely. So they can go on to raise a dream, social media, Facebook, um, Twitter, LinkedIn, all of that. I'm on LinkedIn very actively every day. You can get, you can also get in touch with me through the raise a dream website and set up a complimentary call with me. 
And then we can look and see if our services would work for you. If there's, you know, get a better understanding of your goal. And if it does, there's several things that we do. We often have a get events throughout the year, like webinars and training programs, or we can work one-on-one -on -one through mentoring power hour calls. That's awesome. Well, I think uh, in the background, you're magically going to be lifted out of the page for the next people. It seems to happen <laughs> without our intervention. It's quite exciting. It's been marvelous to talk with you. So good. Thank you so much. It was a great conversation with both of you. And I'm excited to see what dreams you raise this year. So many. This, this is one of the dreams. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. Living it right now, actually. It's good. Exactly. so exciting. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Thank you. Wow. That was powerful. I have so many notes. It's incredible. I, like I'm, I'm not going to finish this book today, but it feels like I'm going to. Right. It's amazing. This has been so good. Um, I know I'm here to serve other people, but I'm selfishly gathering all kinds of stuff. We are on our own for the next hour and a half. Yes. Just you and I. So that means that I want to interview you for the next okay. 45 minutes because I want to learn about you. We are new hosts to the Blue Talks Amplify Your Message event, which mm -hmm. means we don't really know each other that well and neither do the viewers. So right. I would love to get to know you. Are you open to that, Scott? I'm totally open to that. Um, <laughs> I I figured you it. would be. Yeah, it's very exciting. I mean, obviously you and I have interacted several times yeah. through Corey Poirier's other things and um, we've, we've been together uh, in, in groups and stuff. So it's really mm -hmm. fun. I'm really enjoying um, getting to meet and know you as well. So about me, well, yeah. pe people call me Coach Scotty. Actually, I wore that shirt today. Where is it? Right here. Yeah, Coach Scott. Oh, there we go. There we go. So my one of my athletes got this made for me, which was pretty cool. But Aww. I've been a personal trainer since the 90s, late 90s, when I quit my career in architecture because I realized I was at the top of the ladder on the wrong building. Um, I was good at what I did, but I really didn't love it. And I had gone to a point where... I wanted to be junior partner in the firm because, you know, yeah. that's what you're supposed to want, right? You want yeah. that big career with the stock options and the benefits and the bonuses and, and, and locked in and secured. You want security. Mm -hmm. And so I was chasing that um, and working a ton and stressed and I didn't know how to feed my body. I was eating junk food all the time and I was really overweight and unhealthy and all kinds of problems. And I kept going to different specialists to try and find out what was wrong. And they never had any real answers. And it just wasn't going anywhere after over a year of all kinds of health problems, ringing in my ears, circulation problems, unexplained dizzy spells, um, no energy, living on caffeine pills because I didn't like the taste of coffee. I still don't drink <laughs> coffee. So yeah, it was a mess. And I finally had my family doctor after going to another failed appointment with a specialist who didn't find anything specific. And I wrote him a two page commentary on, on all the different things that had been happening to mm -hmm. just put it in one spot and handed to the nurse before our meeting. And so I got to the appointment with him and he looked at me. And he said, so is this some sort of slam on the medical system? I said, no, but I'm one guy. You see a hundred people a day for 30 to 85 seconds. And, and I can't live like this. I'm 29 and my life is a mess. Like I can't, this, I can't, we, I need a solution here. Not just another specialist that says, I don't know. So he did a physical and we had a conversation. And in that conversation, he, he said things like, well, are you under stress? Yeah. I'm trying to make junior partner. I'm working hundred, 120 hours a week. And he said, well, how much sleep do you get? Four or five hours a night, sometimes a little more. And, uh, he says, well, how's your diet? Do you eat well? I'm like, I don't know. I eat, I eat food. Yeah. Like I try to eat low fat. Cause that was a trend back in the, in the nineties, yeah. which is the dumbest trend in the world, but whatever. I mean, yeah. I don't know what I was doing and you know, fruit loops or mini wheats for breakfast. Cause they're yummy. <laughs> uh, you know, and cupcakes twice a day, uh, 10 and three, because intravenously. You know, Sure. If I could. Yeah. And whatever. So I had no idea. And, and he says, well, how much do you exercise? I'm like, I don't have time to exercise I'm working all the time. And he just said, well, you, your prescription is pretty simple, kid. You need to de-stress, eat right, exercise, get some sleep, drink some water, get a, like, you got to take care of yourself. You're not going to make it to 30. You're going to have a heart attack. And I just did. I, I went and joined a gym and one of my friends was a trainer and I started asking him questions and 
I started working out and within five months, I dropped 40 pounds of fat, put on 18 pounds of muscle for a nearly 60 pound swing. And I was a completely different human being. Everything was different. My attitude, my energy, my outlook, all of the things that were a problem just evaporated. Allergies went away. Tinnitus went away. I was, I had tons of energy. I, everything fixed by changing what I ate and how I recovered. Like what a concept. And so that was great. And so I worked in architecture for about a year, but then I went to a personal development course called Enlightened Warrior Training Camp um, run by a man named, named T. Harbecker. He's kind of like Tony Robbins, but short and Canadian. And, <laughs> right? Is he Canadian? Yes. Yeah. Oh, and, okay. Yeah. And actually, I think he's from Toronto area. Anyway. Nice. I came home from Warrior Camp, and that's where they really teach you really who you are in the potential sense. Not who you are right now, but who you have the potential to be. I got woken up to my potential and I came back and I walked into my boss's office and I handed him my resignation and he was stunned. He's like, you know, we're having an associate partnership meeting in two weeks where you're going to be selected. And I was like, I know, but I can't, I, I can't do this. This isn't my life. This isn't what I love and I need to do what I love. He said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I've been offered a job to be a trainer at the local gym. And I think I'm going to go in and take him up on it. And so I went in to be a personal trainer and I worked at the front desk at the gym and I learned how to scrub toilets and fix the hot tub and <laughs> repair equipment and do all the things. And I learned how a gym runs and um, took, I, I did use contract architecture to pay the bills because it wasn't enough money in it, but it took about two years and I opened my own gym. I opened a 10,000 square foot gym in 2002. And eventually, well, three years later, we expanded it to 15,000 square feet. And I got to chase that dream down and live that existence, which it was amazing because running a business, running my gym, my ADHD was now not a problem. It was an asset. Yes. And I'm here to tell you in architecture, <laughs> it's still shut up, work on deadlines, do your drawings, don't talk to people, music's annoying. Paul, um, your architecture office was different than mine. Is that right? <laughs> yep. Yep. We we had conversations all day long. We had open floor plan. It was very much a community feel. Well, and we had that to a degree too, but as an ADHD guy, I had too much conversation. Oh. <laughs> right? I, I was hard to focus. And it was interesting. I was getting better as the year, years went by because I, I realized without a deadline, I was a problem. Yes. As soon as I had a deadline, I was a miracle worker. Okay. And so we had to keep me in deadlines. And I ended up getting to project management and site yes. supervision, which yes. I was phenomenal at because that really fed my ADHD. Mm -hmm. But running a business feeds it, it util utilizes it to the max. And that was great. I learned a ton. You know, all of a sudden I'm the manager of 27 people and, and, and owning this business. I learned, like we had in our interview with Patrick Verano, I learned a ton about working with people and being a leader, not a boss and creating a family that works together in a business environment. It wasn't perfect, but we, we got better every time. And during that process, I had an opening in my world of, well, okay, this is great. And I've, I've done this bodybuilding kind of thing and I've done this fitness thing and I've done this and I've opened the gym and okay, well, I want to, why do I need a new challenge? And there was a half Ironman triathlon in town. And I thought, I wonder if I could finish a triathlon. <laughs> I, mean, I can, I can not drown if I fall off a water ski when I was a kid, you know, I, I can, I can water ski. swim. <laughs> Right. I've never swam yeah. laps and I've never yeah. swam open water, but I can, I can not drown. So that's cool. And as a spin class instructor, I could ride the snot out of a bike, an indoor bike for an hour. <laughs> yes. Well, how hard else could you, man? I could do that. And I used to run in high school because I grew up with the whole Terry Fox movement. I remember walking oh, yes. across the country and just grabbing me by the heart and mm. becoming a runner at age. 12 13 right so that was where i i'm never mind uh <laughs> like so 
I was part of the very first Terry Fox run and, and, and was running 10 Ks. And I joined the cross country running team. I used to love to run, but then, uh, when I was in grade 10, I broke my back, um, grade nine, Ooh. grade nine, I broke my back in a gymnastics accident. I crushed the tops and bottoms of T12, L1, L2, cracked L1 and a half and bulged a disc. And I landed flat on my back facing the ceiling on the vaulting horse. Oh so my God. Yeah. Do not recommend. No. Um, so I was told by several different doctors, um, you'll be in a wheelchair by 40 and uh, don't run, don't play sports. It's way too risky. One hit and you're paralyzed. And so I lived in fear for five, six years. I didn't, I was, I was so afraid to do anything and my back hurt all the time. Yeah. And, you know, I would, I would shovel the driveway and take painkillers and lay on the, on the couch with a, with an ice pack for two hours after shoveling the driveway, I couldn't do anything. So that was how that was. But then once I got fit and healthy and I had musculature to support my spinal column, it stopped hurting. <laughs> Who knew? And, uh, right. <laughs> exactly. So that was good. And then I thought, Oh, you know, so I used to run in high school and my back's healed and I'm stronger now. I bet you I could pick up running again. So I thought I'm going to give it a try. And I hired a coach to teach me to swim and to teach me how to ride outdoors. And I bought a bicycle, an outdoor bicycle. And I started to pick up running again and it was great. So I started training for triathlon and I immersed myself in the culture of it. And I started reading a bunch of books and uh, learning all the different coaching features and pieces. And I did my first sprint triathlon in May of 2005 and I loved it. I think I was 14th overall. And I was like, this is awesome. And then <laughs> I did an Olympic distance. So a little bit longer and I was in the top, I don't know, 20% or something and I, in a big race in a big city. That was exciting. And then I did the half Ironman in town in Silver Lake and I was eighth in my age group. And I got a qualifying spot for Ironman Canada five weeks later. So in five weeks, I doubled all my distances and I started training for a full Ironman and I went to Ironman Canada and I did a 3.8 K swim, 180 K bike and a marathon. My first marathon after a six hour bike and an hour and 27 minute swim. So I crossed that finish line in under 12 hours and I was over the moon. Like my whole life changed. It was the first time I'd ever been proud of myself ever. Aww. Cycling up Yellow Lake, I cried. On my bike by myself, I cried. Yeah. Because I had done this. Me. I did this. There was nobody else. It, it was a thing I did. And I was, for the first time in my life, genuinely proud of myself. And it was a game changer. Mm -hmm. So that was really cool. And then it kind of polluted for a while, though, because I started doing Ironman's to get the attention of my family and it became uh, a whole different thing for a while and and that was an interesting energy it took a while to come through out of that and while i was doing ironmans i heard about ultraman which is two and a half times longer it's a 10k swim 426k bike and an 84 and a half k double marathon a three-day triathlon and I thought, I wonder if I could finish one of those. And psychologically in the background was, well, if I do that, then my family will be proud of me. <laughs> then they'll notice. Then I'll be okay. Then I'll be good enough. Mm -hmm. right? So I did mm -hmm. Ultraman Canada and I was sixth overall. I was within 20 minutes of second place. I had the race of my life and I just loved it. And my family didn't notice at all. You know, my wife did. My wife is amazing. I love her. She's a phenomenal. She's my all-time believer in her. She's my cheerleader. She's so that, I, but my whole other family didn't even notice. Aww. Right. So then I qualified for the world championships and I thought they'll notice that. <laughs> no, they didn't. And there's nothing against my family. God bless them. I love them. It's just not, they don't, it's not about, I was seeking something broken from childhood. That's not seekable. It's not findable. And so that was an interesting thing. Went to the world championships in 2013, had a phenomenal race, finished 21st in the world and loved it and thought, okay, I'm going to come back in 2015 and I'm going to race this, like not try to do well, but I'm going to race it. I want to be kind of top five. And in 2015, I had a phenomenal swim, one of my best. 
phenomenal day one bike. I was 14th overall to the finish of day one. And mid part of day two, I was 10th overall. I was hunting number nine on the bike, having a phenomenal, phenomenal race. And I was going down a bit of a mountain in the rain. And apparently there was algae on the bridge deck and my front wheel slid out and I cartwheeled down the highway at 69 kilometers an hour. And I broke all kinds of things. I sprained fingers, sprained my wrist. I broke my left arm in half. I shattered my left shoulder. I broke five ribs. I busted up my knee and tore a big chunk of cartilage and, and ripped my MCL. I scraped down the side of my ankle. I scraped down the side of my face. And while I was spinning, my helmet twisted and I flopped over and I busted my skull open, exposing my brain and had one of the worst brain injuries you can get. And I woke up three days later in the brain trauma unit on a different island, in Oahu, not knowing how I got there or what had happened. And the interesting thing was we were filming it. <laughs> we were filming for a documentary, which we thought, hey, let's make a movie because that'd be pretty cool. There's this regular schmo Canadian Alberta guy who's kind of a little bit stocky and he doesn't look like a triathlete. You know, he's 200 pounds. Well, triathletes are 140. What's he doing here? But I'm stubborn. So I thought I'd make a neat film. And uh, again, wanted to show the movie to my family so hey look see is you never ask about it but look yeah so there was that in the background mm -hmm. and so the plot of the film changed <laughs> the plot changed and i knew upon waking up i still wanted to get back to racing i knew that that was that was just never a question i would get back to racing and i would get back to the world championships so then I began a three-year journey of doing that. So they put metal parts in me and then they took them back out again and they rebuilt my knee and I started training and it was a devastatingly difficult road. But three years later in 2018, I made it to the start line of the Ultraman World Championships and I did it. I pulled it off and I had a blast because in the meantime, I had discovered all of the subconscious pieces that were driving me before. I realized why I crashed that subconsciously I crashed on purpose to get attention. And once I understood that and because there was, because I was doing well and in my old, you know, we talked off camera, but we were talking about how your subconscious mind is not the CD. It's the CD player and you can change the CD. And I was playing an old tune. Right. I was playing an old tune. Complete with nostalgia. Yeah. You're not good enough. Nobody likes you. You're unworthy. You're a piece mm -hmm. of garbage. You're not allowed to succeed. You're a loser. You're a failure. You suck. That was going on and on and on while I was top 10 in the world. And they're not congruent. Nope. And so the subconscious says, well, this has to stop. You can't succeed. And so I crashed. Right. And so once I learned that, because I went to Germany and I worked with a specialist named Jörg Clausen, and he does something called vegetative training, which you do powerful deep breathing exercises and you reconnect with your vagus nerve and your, your parasympathetic response system versus your sympathetic response system. Yeah. And once we woke that up and he started processing me through the crash and asking questions and looking at things, we discovered all of the pieces that were running me and they were broken. Right. And that was hugely powerful. So when I raced in 2018, I raced for the joy of it, for the love of it, because I love to swim and I love to ride my bike and I love to run and I love being with my friends and I love the challenge and I love the other athletes. And I got to enjoy the race and it was amazing. I had the best time and we filmed it and it's now an award-winning documentary film. It's 82 minutes. It's family friendly. There's no cursing in it. There's no anything that you need to worry about. Um, there is a scene where there's me being hauled into an ambulance and there's the footage of a six foot diameter pool of blood on the highway. And so there's you know, some, some tense scenes and you're going to need to because it's emotional. Yeah. Um, Drew Kenworthy from Shoelace Me did an amazing job of the film. So that has been a phenomenal journey. And then in 2020, the world changed and my gym got shut down and as all gyms did. And at first I was just going to fight in true warrior form. I'm just going to fine. We'll do online videos and we'll do an online program. We'll do online courses and I'll teach people online. I'll do videos every day and I'll, I'll 
and and that's what I was going to do. And I started making videos and started making nutrition plans and started making an online challenge and all that stuff. And, and 48 hours later, I was like, what are you doing? Let's do the math on this. And I just stopped. I pulled up an Excel spreadsheet and I started looking at all of the costs to keep my building empty with no members, no payments. And what would I have to achieve online to succeed? And I knew it was a total disaster. There's no chance we would survive. None. And I would lose my house and everything. And so I stopped. I pulled my staff together for a very emotional meeting. I let them know that this is over. I paid everybody out in cash to make sure they were taken care of. Announced it to the world. We sold off all of our equipment within a week kind of thing. Because like, people were buying fitness equipment second only to toilet paper. <laughs> yes. Right? Yes. In the beginning. And so we sold off all our equipment. And I paid off everybody, people that I owed money to. Everybody got cleared up. And we walked away. We lost a lot. But we weren't negative. Hmm. And then I called the real estate people and I'm like, well, I did that right away. And I'm like, okay, we need a renter for the building or we're stuffed. And we found a church that had needed a home for five years. And this was perfect for them. Aww. And actually a year later, we started going to the church because we realized they're really good people. And it's, a, it's an alignment. So that's now our church. So we go to the the old gym building every day it's just or every every week but it's a church now instead of a gym so it's a different kind of uh strengthening <laughs> it is yeah and then to finish it up so then there was that three to six month period after getting everything all tied up cleaned up and the church moved in in july of 2020 of well now <laughs> what am i gonna do i don't know what i do when i'm not a gym owner trainer guy and what mm -hmm. what what do you want to do with your life? And I thought about it a lot and I kept circling back to coaching people and helping people because I still had lots of knowledge. I've been a trainer for 24 years. So I did build, I took some, our most successful programs that we ran in the gym. I made them online and I run a 21 day nutrition reset the first Monday ish of every month. And I've got a six week challenge and I do one-on-one -on -one training and I coach endurance athletes and I have renovated two bays of the garage in my house and it's now a gym and i bought we 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 remortgaged and i bought a swim spa so an endless pool kind of a thing so i can now coach triathletes to, to I, everything i can we can do a full treadmill swim like it's, it's like a swimming treadmill right there and then walk 20 feet and then here's a treadmill and then here's a bike trainer and so i can coach in this little area and work one-on-one -on -one with people. And it is the biggest gift in the world. I'm home all the time for my family. I'm not gone all the time. And it's way more in, it's not only, I would say it's in balance, but it's not balance. It's integration. Yes. It's, it's integrated. What I love to do is integrated with my family and my life and my balance and every, it's, and, and now that I'm, I'm doing keynote talks and, and things like these podcasts and, I just am in love with my life. Like, I can't even believe it's true. It's amazing. So is, this, is this the first time in your life that you're in love with your life? No. When I opened the gym, I was in love with my life for a while. And then it started to change. After about three or four years of running the gym, it's just a business. Yeah. And sometimes staff are horrible, awful, <laughs> negative people, and they do really destructive, hateful things. And even, and I'll say, especially the ones that you bent over backwards to help extra are the worst and the most ungrateful and the most spiteful and the most hurtful. And that's nasty. And running a business is paying bills every week and taking care of things you don't really want to take care of or pay attention to, but they have to be done and it's relentless and it's seven days a week. There are no rest periods. And if your two-year-old hasn't seen daddy today because you left before he was awake and now it's 10 o'clock at night and he's sleeping, you're not going to see him again today. And it's been three days since you've seen your son 
And that's awful. Yeah. That's awful. And so that became more towards a nightmare. And there was a time when the gym industry had changed so much away from the family gym towards box gyms with nothing per month to join. And as a one-off family gym, I couldn't afford nothing per month. I can't have a gym membership at $25 a month. We'll fail. So we were $55 a month and people go, well, that one's cheaper. I'm going there. And then they would leave. Members that you'd poured your heart into would leave because it was cheaper. And then a year later, they'd come back and they go, well, that gym sucked. So we'll try it again. But you guys are so expensive. <laughs> we're meanwhile, not a gym. We're an experience. Well, right. And meanwhile, I can't afford to pay myself. I made sure my staff were paid and they all want raises, but I don't even get a paycheck. Like after a while, you're just like, what are you doing? You're just a martyr now. You're just suffering. Hmm. And so the last few years of running the gym was just me suffering. And so I didn't love it anymore. I loved the idea of it. I loved the people. I had amassed an amazing staff of friends and good people that I cared about. Hmm. But the frustration was... I couldn't afford to pay them the way I wanted to. I couldn't afford to pay me. And that was a misalignment. And now I'm totally in alignment. And it's beautiful. Celebrate it. Yeah. <laughs> I love cool. that so much. So I want to know, I want to know your deepest, darkest secrets and your greatest desires. So... <laughs> <laughs> this is me. Oh, this is me. Ooh. Um, yeah, no, all of it. No, the question is, um, out of this whole journey of just everything, and I, I mean like everything, what is that message? What is one of your messages that you are trying to share with the world? Mm, good question. You know, Patrick touched on it in, in our interview earlier today. And it, it's stoicism. It's that the obstacle is the way. It's that all of these challenges are a gift. They have made me stronger. They have made me a better person, a better leader, a better mentor. They I use them as fuel to inspire other people, which is my biggest joy, is inspiring other people. Yes, I can teach you all about macronutrients and micronutrients and I can teach you how to feed your body for the best success. And I can teach you about FODMAP and anti-inflammation and, and, and all the, I, like, great. That's neat. But I can teach you all of those biochemical pieces of nutrition within the framework of all that I have learned from all of the challenges I've faced, because that's what's hard about eating well and exercising. It has nothing to do with knowing what to eat. It yeah. doesn't matter what diet you eat. it doesn't matter they all work they all don't work it doesn't matter that's not the problem the problem is life the problem is navigating the world and staying on track for your goals in a world that doesn't support them right <laughs> yes what do, thank do, you. Yeah. what do you do when you're stressed mm -hmm. how do you handle food pushers how do you handle celebrations that involve things you know that aren't good for you all of that how do you handle exercising when you're just not in the flipping mood today is valentine's day i'm yeah. lactose intolerant <laughs> there goes oh. chocolate no i bought myself strawberries yeah and, and dark chocolate chips because dark chocolate doesn't hurt as much doesn't bug you yeah and here's the thing <laughs> That's it. valentine's day this is a news flash valentine's day is not about food. No. It's about people. Love. It's about the love of my life and my son and my family and loving people. It's not about food. I only bought them because they were on sale. Sure. I love strawberries. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's you loving yourself. And that's mm -hmm. the thing. Like, so binge eating a bunch of junk food oh, no. on Valentine's day. So you can feel like a bag of crap tomorrow was not self-love. It's punishment. Mm -hmm. And I'm not yeah, have a little chocolate. Sure. But not 
a Vegas buffet amount of chocolate. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Oh my God. My face would be broken out and I would be so sick. Yeah. It's not a good time. I've had to learn those lessons the hard way a few yeah. times before they really stuck. And that's the neat thing about exploring this and learning is that there's, there's two versions of fun food. It's time to there's, pick up my daughter from school. <laughs> that's all right. There's no, it's no school today. Yeah. There's the psychological element to what, whether it's nachos or cupcakes or pickles, mm. whatever your thing is. Yeah. There's the psychological part of, of junk food. And there's the biological part of junk food. So, I mean, for me, for example, when it comes to Christmas time, I mean, eggnog and I. <laughs> See? Yeah, there's always something. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I have a lot of things I love. Ice cream, eggnog. I'm a sweet tooth guy. My wife's a salty lady, but I'm a sweet tooth guy. I don't have a sweet tooth. I have 32 of them. Um, right? I love eggnog. And I don't love being 10 pounds 15 pounds overweight after christmas that yeah. makes me miserable yeah. and for the longest time almost every christmas i would fill a great big glass of eggnog and i'd be three quarters done before my brain even knew it was eggnog because you're just like oh, yeah right now when i want eggnog that's fantastic i love it it's delicious it's amazing it's wonderful but i have one cup of eggnog and I have a little sip oh my God. and I swish it around and I enjoy, and I'm, I smell it. It mm. tastes good. I enjoy it. I swallow it with purpose and on purpose and I love it and I enjoy it. And it's so good. It takes me 20 minutes to nurse a, a cup of eggnog and I enjoy it. And the biological side is no problem mm -hmm. versus two eight ounce glasses of eggnog. The biological side effect is, well, you just gained three pounds. Like, <laughs> right so that's the place i love to teach people to navigate like yeah does my 21 day reset program teach you how to eat all of the best foods of course but i also make daily mindset videos so you learn the mindset to be the person who eats well so that you become healthy as a side effect hmm. being that person that's um, what i love that i get to do so you are speaking my language with your your message, the whole lifestyle experience versus just here's the details. Here are the facts. Let's just yeah. at, at what point can I eat one third of a banana complete with two almonds that are ground <laughs> in a tea? Like way too much detail. It's you've lost the point. complicated. Yeah, you've lost the point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the lifestyle I stuff. And I, I hear nutrition people, you know, and I'm watching them and study them and stuff. And they're talking about, well, in order to maintain, maintain, um, I'm not going to use the word because I don't want to create a divisive and controversial thing. But yeah. in order to maintain the hormonal state that we're in, you have to have medium chain triglyceride oil at this exact time so that you can maintain the hormones so that your leptin levels kick in so that you can make sure that you're in a fat burning state. So then you, know, you wait one hour, then you can have this many grams of carbide, but just this kind and not that kind. And then you can, you can starve to death for another 24 hours without feeling so bad. And then you can enter, like, you've completely lost the point of being a human being. In my opinion, <laughs> that's just not any fun at all. Uh, like you. I could think of a few things that would fit into that. There's a yeah. lot of chemistry involved. Sure. That's really about knowing who you are as a person, how your body reacts, what yeah. is going on with your life in comparison and integrate it with everything that we were doing, as you had mentioned earlier. Yeah. And can do those things work? Well, yeah, sure they do. But I don't want to be a biochemist with a I'm not a robot. Watch. I'm not a robot. No. It's not a, well, I'm hungry. I want to eat something. <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, I have another friend of mine who is also into health, wellness, body nutrition, and um, like positive body confidence. That's the word I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And I had told her at one point that I was getting on the scale every day. And I had, I had to tell her, I was like, don't worry. I'm actually not caring about the number. 
what I'm doing is I am recalibrating my self-awareness with one of the many tools that I use, which just happened to be the scale, to go, how am I feeling today? I feel a little extra bloated. Is there something else going on? What are the numbers telling me? And the scale was just a tool to be like, yeah, you're right. You're on par. Keep going. Cool. It didn't matter what the number was. <laughs> it's just data. It is data. It's just, it's just data. Um, oh, that was my, you. <laughs> that's me saying, oh, in 10 minutes, we switch to you, which is great. Um, it's just data. Yeah. Knowing what you ate is just data and how much you ate. That's just data. And when you look at the data, you can understand, okay, well, I went out to a restaurant and I had a whole bunch of salty, sugary things and whatever I had. And I went to the movies. I had a bunch of salty popcorn. And I step on the scale the next day and I'm up three pounds. Okay. So that's water retention because all the sodium and it's new foods and I eat extra carbohydrates and carbohydrates cling to water molecules more than fat does. And so, you know, I'm, I'm up, but you know what, what I'm going to do now is eat well. That's my that's Wait, and, this and then tomorrow <laughs> and the next day, the weigh scale will go back down because mm -hmm. your body will re-regulate mm -hmm. and you just carry on. Oh, yes. Saturday was D and D day. So there was lots of popcorn and carbohydrates sure. <laughs> yeah. that I don't normally have, but I, I get it lifestyle. And it, it really is my level of self-awareness with my body that has gotten me this far. Mm -hmm. There are lots of things that I don't know. So behind the scenes, I would love to have a conversation with you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, it's, it's fun. It's exciting. And yeah, we're, uh, we got eight, nine minutes left, but yeah, I want to know how people would get in touch with you and how they would work with you now, this new rendition of Scotty. Do you go by Scotty or Scott? Because I don't either right. one. People call either me one. Coach Scotty. You can call me Scott. You can call me Scotty Fit. It doesn't matter. Whatever you like. Okay. Yeah. My gym used to be called Best Body Fitness, and we shortened it. We called it Body Fit. And so people started calling me Scotty Fit. Oh, right. yes. So that's where it So my website is scottyfit.com. And yeah, and I'm really excited. I actually, I have a phenomenal guy that I've been coaching for, for fat loss and nutrition um, for the last eight months. And him and his wife are now both working with me and he's down, oh gosh, 40 or 50 pounds or something. And, and he, but he's a computer genius guy. And he popped over to the house because he, he lives a couple provinces over in Manitoba, but he was visiting and he says, Hey, how's it going? We were chatting. And he says, I want to see your podcast room. Oh, cool. So he came up and I show him to him. He says, how's it going? I said, Oh, pretty good. He says, um, I said, I need a new computer though. This one's really slow. And he goes, Oh, can I have a look at it? Sure. So he, yeah, he, he boop, 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 did. And, and he rebuilt the thing. Oh, he rebuilt it. He, 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 Undo, he got rid of a bunch of crap that was a problem yeah. and then he usually ram processors sometimes your video card yeah well a little bit of that stuff but what was interesting is the stuff he fixed <laughs> when he was here the first time ruined my computer it was so slow and it was awful and he says i know but we have to do that to get to this so he uninstalled a bunch of garbage and things like old software that was supposed to be spyware but it was actually might as well have been a virus the way it was going right Aww. so he got that stuff out and he fixed a bunch of things and then he had to leave. Then he remoted in and we fixed a few more things, but he sent me, okay, go to this computer shop and buy this and that. So I bought a bunch of Ram and I bought a solid state hard drive and it Ooh. arrived. Yeah. And then he walked me through how to seamlessly swap everything over. And my, I have a brand new computer. Basically it's yeah. 10 times faster, legitimately 10 times faster, like provable 10 times faster. It's seamless. It's dependable. It's amazing. So he's just been super helpful guy because he's so thankful for how I've helped him, which is great. And on the weekend, him and I worked together for almost 12 hours and we built my brand new website and I'm really excited. So scottyfit.com is now beautiful and it works. Brand so, new website. Brand new website. Fresh and clean and this oh. new version of Scotty. Yeah. So, um, so ironically, we haven't got the, the, if you email me now, that doesn't work yet. We're working on it. Hmm. We got to do those pieces, but to get a hold of me is pretty easy. So scottyfit.com, you can, you can find me there and warriorcodefilm.com is, oh. um, that's where the movie is. It's free on YouTube and you can find me on Facebook as Scotty Fit Sylvan. And I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn and all of those usual things. So I'm fairly findable. 
on the new website, although the click to contact me doesn't work at the top of the homepage, my email is listed. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's how you get a hold of me. Sweet. And what do you have coming up? Coming up, I have a, my next 21 day nutrition reset starts March 7th. I'm in the midst of one right now and in the midst of a six week program right now. And so those are all going really well. So that's exciting. So the next 21 day reset starts March 7th and I'm training for, for Ironman Canada. This oh. year. And I was, I was accepted to the Ultraman world championships for, for 2021 and it got canceled. Well, in 2020 it got canceled, but, um, and I've decided not to enter this year like i could just renew my application and i decided not to this year because i'm writing the book which is the backup to the 82 minute documentary uh -huh. because it's a phenomenal film and there's so much more to tell hmm. so I'm, I'm writing the book to fill in all the pieces that the film touches on but can't fully go into so i'm really excited to finish that book and i've committed to having the rough draft done by the end of March. I'm at, I think almost 40,000 words right now. And yeah. um, I forget how many pages, 130 pages with photos and stuff. Okay. And so I've committed to finish writing that by the end of March. And so we can get into the editor and the formatter and everything. So we've got a deadline of having it be Amazon bestseller by July 1st. So working backwards with a self-published yes. school, people, group, all that kind of, an, and I've got a, a book coach mentor. And so we're, and I just thought in the world where that's really important to me, training for 25 hours a week for the world championships doesn't fit because something will have to give. And so, yeah, I've got a lot on the go right now, but I want it also to not be coach Scotty beats himself into oblivion with too many deadlines. <laughs> Because that's not fun either. No. Mm -hmm. So that's oh, what's coming yeah. up for me. I like that. Yeah. It's it's nice to see your evolution. Like the first time we met, I you still had the gym. This was, of course, before COVID. And I, I didn't really know what you did. What I did know was that you have an architecture background. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I do too. Yay, we yeah. have something in common. And yeah. then you're in the fitness world. And I used to do wellness coaching on the side while working at the architecture um, office. And I'm just like, we have so much in common. And then this whole switch, I have noticed that you were, I don't want to use the word calm, but like more confident in who you are like your yes. identity of where you want to go instead uh, of just rolling with it in the moment mm -hmm. 100%. So to highlight that for you if you haven't yeah. noticed already yeah so true i am i'm in love with my life and i like me a lot better the way i am now compared to where i was i was not happy running the gym anymore it was too hard mm. i wasn't getting paid i never got to see my family i was a martyr i was suffering for others and it was um, it was miserable it wasn't cool i kept thinking it was going to get better and it never did and now everything i do is just magic i just i'm having so much fun i have people now that so when you do my 21 day nutrition reset the first jump through is $97. It's the price of supper for two. And, and you get a 90 page manual that I've put together and you get daily mindset videos in a private Facebook group. And it's great. If you want to do it again, it's only 27 bucks to repeat for as many times as you want to. And I have people now that have repeated it. One lady, 13 times, uh, one lady, eight or nine, one lady, seven or eight, another couple guys are six or seven that they just keep repeating it because they want to stay in the energy, yes. relearn from the videos because the more times you see, the more that you absorb and stuff like that. And, and in January and February, I had some of these people going, coach, you don't charge enough to repeat. I'm like, well, I understand that, but I want it to be available for everybody. I don't want that to be a barrier. They're like you clearly don't charge enough for how much you help us and all the things because I'm 100% available. If you're at the grocery store, you send me a screenshot. I will look at the ingredients and say yes or no or this instead. I'm available all the time. If you're at a restaurant, you don't know what to order off the menu. 
people screenshot the menu and say, I'm stuck between this or that. What's better on plan? And I'll say, do this and get that on the side. Thanks, coach. Like you do not charge us enough. I was like, well, I want to make it available. I want to help people. And so I had, I think in January, I had eight or nine people pay double or quadruple what I like. So instead of paying 27, they paid 100 or 50. Um, because so that to me feels like, okay, I'm on the right path. I'm this, this is where I should be. And this is what I should be doing. As long as you're not taking away from you to give to them at the same time. Yeah. So yeah, that's a needle to thread. I, know, I, yeah. I have to be mindful of that. Right. Not on my phone all the time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So before we go, um, I have one last question. Yeah. I mean, I have so many questions, but for this, I have one last question, uh, which I forgot, but that's fine. I, I'm so interested in, okay, what do you want to leave people with? If there was one thing that you needed people to just know and absorb and completely understand about the work that you do, what would that be? Never surrender. Um, one of my favorite things that I coach on is it's a circle and it's AFC NGU. It means this. Okay. <laughs> action. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Action. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there's a circle and at the top there's an A and there's an yeah. arrow to the F and an yeah. arrow to C and then an arrow back to A. You're going to take some action. And you're going to get feedback. Whatever that feedback is, you move to C, which is correct or continue. Action, feedback, correct or continue. Action, feedback, correct or continue. So you take some action. If the feedback is negative, you make a correction and you take more action. And you get some feedback. And if it's still negative, you make a correction, you take more action. And if you get feedback that it's awesome, you continue and take more action. And in the middle, NGU, never give up, never surrender. You don't, and you can't fail. You can never fail Aww. that model, ever. I love that model. My favorite, favorite thing. One of my favorite quotes, and I have several, is Babe Ruth. It's hard to beat a person that never gives up. It is. Yeah, and Babe Ruth, everybody knows, he was the champion home run record holder for baseball he held that record for over 40 years, 714 home runs. What people don't realize is he also held the record for the most strikeouts. Yes. He always swung at the ball. Yeah. Always. But nobody but remembers those numbers. They don't remember those. Michael <laughs> Jordan, 52% of the time he missed. Yep. Missed. 15,000 times he missed. So that's, I love that song. So um, now we kind of do the... But before we do, I would love to just take like a two minute break where both of us <laughs> go use the bathroom. All of our viewers can do the same thing. What a great we'll get idea. a notebook. If you don't have one already, grab a yes. pen, glass of water, something, right? Just, just a little reset, rest your mind a little bit, take mm -hmm. a couple deep breaths, wiggle, right? All of that. And then come back. Yes. It is time for a bio break. A bio break, a mental health break, whatever you want to call it. Yes. Is that fine by you? I Got love you. that idea. Okay. Um, I'm going to push my stop cam and I hopefully have a beautiful picture come up instead. Is that? Yeah, that what that's what I was hoping. Yeah. You do thought. yours and I'll let you know. Oh, oh there's no picture. That's you might okay. have to go into your camera settings. I have settings. to go to camera settings on this because it's a new software for me. I would have to yeah. build my little profile. Camera, virtual background. No, that's not going to work. Yeah, I know. That's okay. That's okay. We'll do it. Let's go for a bio break. We'll be back okay. in a couple minutes. We'll be back in two minutes, so about 20 after the hour. Okay, Bye. perfect. See you a sec. Oh, yeah, I have to take the camp or the, <laughs> the sound off. As
Ta-da! <laughs> this is my lunch two and a half hours late. Well, <laughs> that happens. Is that a protein shake? Uh, it's a full nutritional shake. Nice. Yeah. I would, uh, I would coach be mindful that once you re-liquefy powdered nutrition, it starts to break down. So it does have a yeah. time limit. I know. Yeah. No, I made it right before we went live today. Cause I'm like, okay, I'm going yeah. to need some sort of food and water, which of course I have my Mario cup with me. So, um, yeah, which is excellent. So I'm going to give you next. What's interesting. Corey has sent a message, Corey Poirier, our yeah. esteemed coach. And he says, you guys are doing awesome. Um, Scott interviewing Laura next. Absolutely. Last guest Ethel is coming up in about 40 minutes, which is great. Comments have been coming in from the various pages, but not showing up inside StreamYard. So uh, if Corey wants to post any of those for us to consider, that would be spectacular. And maybe we can dovetail those in as we jump into, all right, Miss Laura Lake. Ooh, tell us cool. all about yourself. Who are you? Tell it. What do we need to know about you as this just amazing person that I just am really enjoying being with? Three words. I am Laura Lake. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> Isn't that four words? I am is one word. Oh, <laughs> right. Got yeah. It. No, we. I have three communities that I absolutely love to be a part of. And that was just one of our conversations lately is, well, I have this room on Clubhouse. It's called the Courageous Connection Club. Nice. And we were talking about identity as speakers. And yeah. the question last week was, I want to be the next fill in the blank. <laughs> so we had that conversation. I want to be the next Tony Robin, the next Brene Brown, the next, you know, whatever, instead of saying, I want to be the next Laura Lake. Correction, yes. I am the next Laura Lake. Correction, I am Laura Lake. I wanted them to go through that process. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so a little bit about me is I have a similar yet different background to you, which is exciting. I knew since the age of five that I wanted to be in architecture, but I had no idea what it was called at all. Like the Sunday paper always had a floor plan in it. So my brother and I would just cut it out and we'd keep it in a duo tang that we made. We just glue it to a sheet of lined paper. And then we would spend the next hour or two critiquing that design with all the other ones that we had collected. Oh, cool. <laughs> It was, it was so much fun. But then in junior high, I went to my one and only summer camp, which was a science and entrepreneurship camp. That's when I learned that there's this thing called entrepreneurship that I could do that had nothing to do <laughs> with getting a job, like the traditional way about life. And I went, wait, wait, wait. I can be my own boss. That sounds amazing. I want to do that. And I don't know how to do it yet. So I, I went through high school like that, thinking of the whole architecture thing. So I was like, I'm going to become an engineer or an architect or whatever. Lots of stories behind that, but I'll keep it short and sweet. Then I went to university. I took engineering. I went to college afterwards because I found out University architecture does not have drafting classes unless it's manual drafting. So they don't actually teach you how to use the programs to do the things that I want it to do. Oh. So I went to college instead and I took that stuff in college. So I went from second last in my class in university to second in the entire school. Oh, wow. In college. Yeah. Mindset shift. That was one of the biggest mindset shifts of my life. Everybody told me university is so hard. It's so hard. It's so hard. I made it hard. Halfway through the year was when I found out architecture didn't have the drafting that I wanted. So I just really stopped working. Yeah. I went to class. I wrote the tests because I needed to, and I didn't do any extra work. But then college came. And I liked the teachers and I liked the way that they were teaching and I loved the subjects still. So and you could see the difference in the mindset yeah. between the two. Went on, I worked for an architecture firm for almost eight years. The same architecture firm. I was in the industry for almost 15. 
before I got laid off. And then, and then my boss had said to me, he's like, you know what? You could always go and get an admin job. <laughs> Wait a minute. I got a button for that. I, know. I was not impressed. Not impressed because everybody, I love networking events. I would always be at these architecture events, meeting people and talking about the work and the projects that we were working on. Everybody knew me. So when I was laid off, they were like, wait, Laura's looking for a job? And they kept offering me jobs that I didn't even know were out there because they weren't on websites. Got all of them. This is when the crash happened. Or no, right after the crash. So it was 2014. Right. And you know the architecture industry. When when the economy crashes, the private or sorry, the public sector spends money. Right. When the economy is up, the private sector spends the money. It's right. usually those transition periods that we had trouble. So this was one of those transition periods. Mm -hmm. And I went, this is the time that I can do that thing that I didn't know what it was before called entrepreneurship. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was health coaching on the side this whole time. And my architecture was really focused on sustainable lifestyle design, which is how my business name came about. Sustainable design. <laughs> I just okay. made up a word. Yeah. I've, I've always created. Say that word again. Sustainable. I like it. Sustainable, sustainable. lifestyle design. I, I believe that our health is very closely related to the health of the planet. So all of my architectural designs took into account the physical, mental, and spiritual well-being of its occupants. Mm -hmm. All of them. Yes. So even doing architecture, I was like, okay, what is this space saying for my mental health? And not just air quality. No, like what is the person thinking and feeling in that space? If, okay, one of my first architectural projects on my own to put it into context, was a wellness center who came to me and they're like, every person that comes into our office doesn't come back. <laughs> they don't like to rebook. We're having a lot of problems getting them to come for their, their sessions that they need. Mm -hmm. We don't understand. They don't feel comfortable. So I took a tour of their space. It was a very institutional looking space, which did not scream wellness to me at all. Right. So I had to tell them the news that, hey, you know, this space, if anybody has any sort of anxiety and when, when they're diagnosed with anything or they're having issues, they're already stressed. And now you want to put them into like a high contrast physical environment that adds to their stress. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of just an example of what that looked like. I tried doing my business through that lens, through the, the well standards, the lead standards, the, you know, R2000 and all of that kind of stuff, the passive yeah. house. Yeah. Here in Canada, they were just not ready for my style of design. Right. Something like Europe or Australia in those those health centered cultures very oh, much, yeah. but not so much here. So yeah. I was like, fine. I'm just going to focus on the other thing that I did this whole time, <laughs> health coaching <laughs> that I had never been paid for. Um, and now I'm just all of a sudden demanding money. I had all these money blocks. I had all these imposter syndrome <laughs> thoughts. I had all of this mess plus on top of that PTSD, depression and insomnia. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What, yeah. yeah. What brought about this whole being laid off thing started with a bicycle accident. Okay. So I was biking to work, which I loved. Absolutely loved it. And then I'm going down this really steep hill and I see this vehicle in a driveway with her brake lights on. My parents always taught me, pretend everybody else on the road is dumb and doesn't know how to drive. So I started slowing down. I was like, she's going to be an idiot. She's not going to see me. She's going to run into me. I'm just going to slow down. I'll be fine. She came out of the driveway 
and I had to go around her the entire time. Like she, she almost ran me over the entire time across the street. I hit a telephone pole instead of hitting the car or going under the, the vehicle. And I couldn't feed or dress or clothe myself for weeks. I was on medication. I went to work with a box under my desk and a pillow on top and a string attached to my leg because I couldn't lift it <laughs> with crutches. So you get it. You've been through the whole accident as well. <laughs> and from that point on, I realized that all of that health coaching that I was doing no longer worked the way that it had worked for me every time before. Right. I forgot that health starts from the inside, not the outside. Yeah. All of that diet and exercise that I was doing wasn't working because my sleep was shot. Mm -hmm. My my mental health just couldn't focus on anything. It was constantly stressed, constantly in that that survival mode. So all of those outward factors is what I call them, my external factors like food and, and exercise and stuff, wasn't having the same effect because the chemistry was different. So that's when I created the Bed Mass of Wellness, which is the basis for everything that I do now. Mental right. health is the basis for everything that I do now. Mm -hmm. So I, I work with heart-centered, message-driven solopreneurs. This is why we're here is the whole message piece. Mm -hmm. We all have similar stories of struggle and triumph, something that we learned from it. And I knew that solopreneurs were one of the biggest groups of people who suffered from mental health, just like me. Before COVID, before COVID, it was one in two for entrepreneurs. Yeah. Before COVID. But yet, yeah. that's not what they talk about. De general public was one in five. And for service workers, you know, like emergency workers, was one in three. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs was one in two. Yeah. So think about it. You and me in the same room, at least one of us was yeah. suffering from mental health. So I knew Probably I needed both of us. Step or both of us. Probably both of us. Yeah. I know. I know. I, I just attract those people because <laughs> I'm that caring space. I see who you are through your eyes without the masks that you wear and the armor that you wear. I see your personality. I see your emotions. I can see bits and pieces of the experiences that you've had. So when I speak to you in a way that says, I see you and the rest doesn't matter to me, you just can't help but tell me secrets, which happens all the time. I have random people that come up to me in the grocery store at networking events. And they're like, Laura, I have never said this to anybody, not even my partner, not even my mom, not even my, my therapist or whatever. Nobody, nobody knows only you. It's like, yeah, yeah it's normal. I get this. So now I'm, I'm coaching people through those trauma stories. Cause I also have a background in so many things. I've tried over 50 different modalities and have created my own healing modalities for my clients that are a culmination of these 50 different ones I've tried before, like EFT, like NLP and hypnosis and what else? A little bit of Reiki, some chiropractic, some natural, like it's just everything. And when you had mentioned the vagus nerve earlier, I was like, yes, yeah. I created a vagus nerve stimulation specifically for dealing with trauma where people are uncomfortable to talk about it. So yeah. we can deal with the physical side of trauma so that you can be able to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Part of how I coach people, some of those stories that we speak about on stage are so traumatic. You can tell when somebody is speaking from that place of pain, that hurt. Yeah. Versus somebody who's speaking from the place of love and self-care around their hurt. Right. Completely different feel. Yeah. And so this is why I want to help people with messages to get up on that stage, to speak from that place of love and to heal that side of them so that they can articulate and share their message in a way that connects on that emotional and heart-centered level with their audience. Mm -hmm. Like 
this, ah, uh, as soon as I discovered this just, I don't know, six, seven months ago, I finally felt just like you, this is where I'm meant to be. Yeah. And at every piece of my core, I just feel it. And it has been amazing. Like my life has exploded in these last few months. Yeah. <sighs> That's exciting. It's that, that song I shared with you when we were preparing to be the hosts of this oh, show. Yes. Uh, Andy Grammer, I finally found my hallelujah. I, oof, that song just moved me. But yeah, it's exciting when you're when you're in it, you're in your purpose, in, and that alignment is there, and just woof, it's so powerful. Oh, I tried for years to articulate my business. And yeah. that's what people would get mad at me for. They're like, so what is it that you actually do? Right. <laughs> yeah, because if you're another. if you're so connected to the biggest, deepest part, you, they're not there yet. No. So you're speaking about their heads. Similar for me, if people say, Well, what is it you do? You know, I say, Well, I help people drop five to seven pounds in 21 days by learning to eat good foods. Okay, See? that's what I tell people because that okay, I have a I've got a file folder for that. Yeah. Now, what do I really do? Well, once you come in for that, I teach you that it's about so much more mm -hmm. than that. But if I start with the so much more, we don't have that common language yet and you're just like is that that woo woo crap? I whatever, just tell me what to eat. Okay. <laughs> you're not there yet. Yeah. So you need, you need that bridge that Patrick yep. talked about. You need to build that bridge. Yeah. So now yeah. it's nice and concise. It's like I help heart-centered, mission-driven solopreneurs create clients, not find, create clients right. from the stage by confidently showing up and courageously connecting to their audience. Yes. Yeah. See, completely different feel than yep. before. It's like, I'm, I'm a high-performance coach. I'm a mental health coach. Oh, All those labels I can put on it. No, now I am your courageous connection coach. Yeah. Yeah. Courageous connection. That's courageous awesome. Connection. That speaks well. And yeah. So um, like, what do you, how do people connect with you? How do they work with you? What does it look like to work with you? Is it one-on-one? -on -one? Is it a course? Is it, is, it, is it Zoom calls? How do people work with you? So I'm, I'm reshifting all of that, which is so fun. Instead of doing discovery calls, because I hate discovery calls, and I could spend all day on Zoom or whatever doing one-on-one -on -one calls with everybody, I've decided to create story sessions hmm. that are the hour-long call that we would normally have. But these are working sessions. So if you and I were on one of these story sessions, you get to have that safe space to tell me your story wholly and completely. Hmm. And if you want to cry, which usually happens... <laughs> <laughs> go right ahead. Um, I know I have the tools to help you through that. But also, as you're telling me your story in a certain amount of time, I'm identifying the main piece that's tripping you up. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to teach you that one main piece to help you resolve that. And if you want to do that on your own, great. If you want to work with me, I have a six-month coaching program. And the way that I coach is I teach as well as get you to help teach. Mm. So I am teaching you for 13 weeks at the same time as you're teaching me and you're teaching the other people in the program with us. It's a group thing. People come in at any given time. And then for the next 13 weeks, I'm going to help you get on those stages. So everything that we just learned, um, which replaces the no like trust and buy framework that we were talking about earlier, I have a seven step process that focuses on how you show up to your audience and how you're going to get your audience to show up for you. Mm. I call it the seven step zero to hero process. Cause I haven't thought of a different name yet, <laughs> but that's the one that I, I use to, to structure the solo printer conference. That is, is how the whole day plays out. It is the seven steps that brings you from not knowing somebody to being on the stage, telling your story through these seven steps and inspiring them to take action. Mm, that sounds awesome. Oh, yeah. And then once you learn that kind of stuff, that's when I work with you to come up with that talk 
I mean, you're going to be coming up at the talk. I'm going to be, be making sure you hit those points. Mm -hmm. And then giving you a platform specifically for my coaching clients. Nobody else. There'll be two other keynotes at the beginning of the day and the end of the day that are not my clients, but nobody else is allowed to speak on that stage that isn't my client. Mm. So they have a specific stage for them where we all get to shout their message from the rooftops. And they're going to share it in the way that practices everything that they just learned, as well as they're allowed to sell from that stage. Right. Yeah. So now they're hopefully going to be getting that first client that just pays for everything that we just did. Right. And is that a physical stage in person or are we still online? No, we're going to be doing a digital stage. Okay. And I also help them create their own mini digital stage. So if it's a Facebook event or a clubhouse event where we get multiple speakers that relate to your message, mm -hmm. then we can highlight your message as the main and then have all of them just support you in your message. Yeah. And then you get to sell from your stage and they get the freebies. <laughs> right? So we're still elevating your message. Yeah. And building a community to help you empower that message. Amplify that message. Right. Yeah. Elevate your message before we amplify your message. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's well, that's excellent. Yeah. And so who are your ideal clients? Like who are you looking for predominantly? Are they, are they always entrepreneurs or solopreneurs? Yes. Um, I can work with others, but I really prefer those solopreneurs. These are people without teams yet. Yeah. I want to help them elevate to that level. And to get there, they need to understand the messaging and the clarity around their story. So they can get all of that other stuff. It's like once you have that first client or two, you can afford to hire these people, which you're going to need. But to get to that point, you have to do the internal work. You can't hire it off. You can't get somebody else to do it. If you don't do it now, it's going to affect everything else that you do in your business. Yes. Everything else. Yeah. So I want those people with messages that I connect with as well. Because if I'm going to be teaching you, I want to shout your message from the rooftops. I want to see you not need me. Those are the people I want. I'm serious. I want people who don't need me. I want those people who are going to claw their way into whatever spaces they can to share their message. Because to them, it's that important. They right. know how to do it, but it's that important. They will figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. That's that trust piece too, isn't it? Where your goal is to be such a good coach and help people so much that they don't need you anymore. And mm -hmm. what they do is when people say, wow, you've been so successful. How did you do it? They send them to you. <laughs> and, and the community, not just me. Yeah, I have yeah. I keep people in my pockets, not literally, but <laughs> I have all of these coaches who I know are better than me. At NLP, better than me at marketing, better than me at social media. And when I work with my clients and I see that is your area mm -hmm. that you're really struggling with, I'll give you my two cents mm -hmm. and I will give you my expertise, which I've been learning for more hours than I did architecture. Right. Yeah. While doing architecture, I was learning all of this. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I will give you that and then I will refer you for one free session with one expert that I know that could help you even more because it's yeah. not about me. It's about the community. Yes. And if I can't help you. I'm hoping to know somebody that can. Yes. Cause you can't be all things to all people. Like you mm -hmm. said, your goal is solopreneurs. So if you have somebody who's a stay at home mom or a retired dad, who's just hanging out, that's not your ideal client. You don't. It's a mindset not. piece. Yeah. Yeah, it could, you could help them maybe, but it's not your ideal. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I want somebody who has already taken that leap or mm -hmm. has already taken the action to that leap. I don't want to be the catalyst for you to begin action. I want to see you taking action just like the universe does. Yeah. Like, oh, you've already started doing this because it means so much to you. Well, I'm going to help you. Mm -hmm. That is the space that I want to come in. I don't want to be your everything for your foundation or your support. I'm not there to enable you. I'm there to empower you. Right. And yes. I can only do that from a space of once you've started moving, then I'll help. 
Yes. Yeah. Can't I can't do your push-ups for you. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so true in so many things. So what are um what are some books you love to read? What are some things that people could, you know, grab and take away to be more understanding of your world this way? Ooh, I love the book question because my answer is not like anybody else's answer. I am not the type of person to read books. Okay. Only I'm working on it. I really am. Only because the books are so big and with one person's perspective. Yes. I would read a hundred articles before ever finishing one book. Mm. Yeah. So That's I read thousands of articles. Yeah. But yet to sit down and read one person's book, I feel as though my personal experience, half of that is fluff. <laughs> Why should I spend my time reading the fluff if that's not what I'm looking for? My book won't be fluff. So. <laughs> right? Like case studies. Give me one. I don't need five. Right. The, the other four is fluff. <laughs> but yeah. I find some of those bigger books tend to be like that. But if I read 100 articles on the exact same thing, I am now niching my knowledge and comparing it at the same time. Mm -hmm. I'm getting all of these different viewpoints. And then when I find something that I don't understand and need more in-depth knowledge on, that's when I find a book. Mm. And that's then I can get the in-depth or a course, right? Not just a 30-minute yeah. webinar, something substantial. Like I do three-hour master classes. Mm -hmm. That's something where you can go, you could learn, you can implement on the yes. spot. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a powerful thing, isn't it? And it's funny, I had a, a friend of mine mention that when she, because we talked about what books you're reading, and she likes to pick a topic, mm -hmm. and then she reads five or six books on that topic all at once, at the same wow. time. She'll read a chapter of this one, a chapter of that one, a chapter of that one, a few pages of this one, whatever, because she's, she's said similar things. She's gathering different perspectives on the same subject. Yeah. Rather than just reading one full diatribe from one full perspective and one full opinion yeah. on that subject. That's fascinating because there's so many books out there where people read that one book and they think, okay, that's it. That's the law. <laughs> I'm very much a change maker. I see something like the whole no like trust by framework. I'm like, we could do that better. I don't mind questioning the experts. I don't mind challenging their processes. And I expect mm. people to do the same thing of mine. That's how science works. That's how evolution works. That's how we grow. And I know it's not going to be perfect. But if I can expand on it, if I can elevate it in some sort of way, so that people like me who were known, who were liked, who were trusted by many people and then nobody bought. Yeah. <laughs> right? Um. I can change that story for people coming behind me. Totally. And then they're going to make it better and they're going to change it for the people coming behind them. That's the hope. Just like parenting, right? We want to be better parents than our parents were. And we hope our kids are the same. Right. Yeah. We kind of always do the best we can. Um, <laughs> yeah. like, it's funny. I went to um, a Zen Buddhist retreat not that I'm a Zen Buddhist, but I really love some of the stuff that they do and, and say and stuff. And um, I went to see a lady named Sherry Huber, and she was a Zen Buddhist, uh, a monk, and she was in Calgary. And we had just done this three-day sit-in, and it was the end of Sunday, and we were all blissed out and in love with all the things she'd said, and it was great. And there was question-answer period, and somebody put up their hand, and they said, oh, Sherry, I just loved you, and you're amazing. I learned so many things. She said, can you tell me how can I raise my children to be, to be just perfect and understand all of this ways of just seeing the world as it is and not layering on judgment and, and how can you, how can we raise our children to be amazing and perfect like this? And she, and she's this five foot, nothing, silver haired, beautiful lady. Mm -hmm. And this is 15 years ago now, but um, she just kind of cocked her head to one side and she said, well, and I won't use the language she said because she dropped an F bomb for impact somehow, which was hilarious because oh, she wow. was completely unlike her. Yeah. She said, Well, you're basically gonna screw them up the best way you know how. And I just belly laughed because 
that's it. You're going to screw them up the best way you know how. Like, mm -hmm. I love my son more than anything. <laughs> and, and I'm sure I'm screwing him up just because there's no manual. And, you know, like you said, I'm trying to do a better job than my parents did. But I'm mm -hmm. in that vein, I'm creating different problems because one of my strengths is my street smarts. One of my strengths is my fierce independence which I got because my parents were, they struggled with some things, some addictions and stuff. And there was a lot of stuff going on where, uh, you know, there's whatever. I was an adult child because I had to be, because somebody had to be the adult. And so yes. but that has been my greatest strength. My son doesn't have that. He's molly coddled into this beautiful environment of two loving parents who take care of his every whim and his every need and he doesn't have to learn how to fight for himself hmm. so that's going to be his achilles heel even though i have been doing it to be an asset it's there is no perfect you can't i want to i want to share a tool with you and all of our viewers because i've had this conversation so many times lately okay here's what it is Every time somebody tells you, you are too, whatever, fill in the blank, too loud, too quiet, too direct, too bold, too whatever. Yeah. They are identifying your value for you. Right. <laughs> they just see it differently. It's always two-sided. So if they're saying that you're too loud, being loud is one of your strengths. How can you use that? for the force of good. If you are too direct, I love direct people because sometimes I'm not. And that's exactly what I want, which is why I call books fluff. <laughs> right. Yeah. So when I when I come across those people, it's like, yes, you are my people. I have a good friend of mine who is very direct and she gets a lot of people who are turned off by that. I'm like, that's okay. You are my kind of person. And it's okay if you're not their kind. Everyone yes. is your own cup of tea. So having people identify your too muchness, they're always identifying your value. Always. Yeah. yeah. And also, I would suggest mm. that they're reflecting their weakness. Mm. Right? And their so beliefs. They're saying, shoulders, yeah. you're too loud. And their thought of themselves is, I'm too quiet. Or there's a, there's a flip to it. Yes. Right. They were always taught children should be seen, not heard. And they believe that. So what are you doing being heard? That's the interesting piece, too, isn't it? It tells you a lot about their stories. Mm -hmm. I, I tell my daughter all the time when there are bullies at school, you know, they're going to say things to you. They're going to treat you how they're used to being treated, whatever their comfort zone is. Mm -hmm. They're also trying to share their emotions, which looks differently. So if they go and they hit you, what is that story behind that? Yes. Right? Usually it's some sort of trauma story or stress story. Yeah. And yeah. understanding that, you can look at them with compassion, mm. and a little bit more understanding instead of going, you hit me. You're such a mean person. Maybe that's how their family says, I love you in the weirdest way. Yeah. Or, or normal way for some people. Yeah. It's, it's hard to appreciate that when you're in it. Yeah. Like when I was in, in junior high school, um, the worst bully in the school relentlessly attacked me, hit me, mm. on me threw gum in my hair, did all kinds of horrible things. Awful, 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 mean, spiteful, rotten. I found out later in life that his dad used to beat the crap out of him all the time. And he's just, he's got a, he, he's just lashing out because of what he's stuck with. Like it, in, yeah. and, and I mean, that you can't, it's hard to appreciate that when they're making your life a living hell in, in junior high, but yeah, it's not about a you. lot of practice. It, yeah. It's challenging. And so let me ask you a question as we yeah. round out with five more minutes. Um, I would assume you've done all of these personality typing things. I'm a big fan of them myself. Can I guess you? Oh, but which one? Yeah. Color Spectrums, Myers Briggs, Influencer? Like, okay. So many. You want me to read your eyes? I uh, sure. Okay, okay. You mm -hmm. you can just look into the camera, and I. <laughs> this is fun. No, you don't have to be super close. I can see enough. Okay. Um. What if I did this? 
Oh, no, that makes it worse. <laughs> then it gets blurry. Um, ever since the first time I saw you, like, there are some things that I can read right away. And there are okay. other things that I have to try to piece together. It feels like there's this bowl of puzzle pieces when I look in somebody's eyes. Mm. And it just is thrown on the table in front of me. And I have to piece it together. Mm -hmm. So I already know that you have very extroverted tend tendencies, yet I'm pretty sure you're more of, I'm going to say a stressed introvert because we're not all, yeah, <laughs> we're not all specific to the Myers-Briggs or any other ones that you use. Yeah. A hundred percent. That's yeah. totally true. Yeah. Um, I also want to say, so if we're basing this off Myers-Briggs, usually it's introvert, introvert versus extrovert, then intuitive versus feeling, or sorry, yeah. intuitive versus um, sensor, sensing, the S. Sensory. <laughs> Sensory, yeah, whatever the actual word is. And mm. then it's feeling versus thinking, right. and then judging versus perception. Mm. I'm not 100% clear on what the difference is between the last two, so I don't guess those. Right. But yes, that's, that's your first one. I'm pretty sure you are more, yeah, not pretty sure. I know you are more sensing than you are intuitive, but that doesn't mean that you're not intuitive at all. That means that you just haven't used your intuition enough to really trust it. Like it's there, you know, it's there. Oh well, yeah. You're just like, but this means more to me. Cool. Um, your next one, uh, or sorry, yeah intuitive versus sensing so feeling versus thinking you are in the middle but on the thinking side a little more because mm. you connect so well to people you have learned that so much mm. but it's not your natural state your right. natural state is so there's something that tells me there's something in your young life that has built that skill within you right <laughs> Yeah. And that's so true. Um, feeling, I have learned that feeling is dangerous. Mm. So I've shifted to thinking because yeah. feeling I've gotten in trouble from, which is so right. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. interesting. And feelings can be inaccurate because they're, they're, they're filtered across many different spectrums. Right. Yeah. Um, so then behind yeah. the scenes, you can ask me more personal questions that, <laughs> I will tell you answers to. I love that. I'm like, just ask me about whatever part of your life you want. And I will stare at your eyes or in a photo of you. I have had people send me just this of oh, some wow. random person's face that they knew. That's wild. Oh, you yeah. know, I will say one of the biggest challenges that has hit me is um, that growing up the way I did, my default thought process is nobody likes you they hate you shut up and go away that's my default Protection. and so i see everything from that filter mm -hmm. and whenever anybody doesn't contact me for a little bit i'm like well that's because they hate you they you know, they, they don't like you anymore or whatever like and it's it's so when i'm feeling that i have to outthink it I have to go, Daddy, that's probably not true. <laughs> when you're stressed, you go to your default, which I mentioned was your thinking stuff. Yeah. Ah, sorry. You're just no. highlighting. It's great. That's awesome. I love that's all this stuff. stuff. Yeah. It's fascinating. And that's how I help my clients is I see through that, regardless of how they're acting in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's powerful, powerful, good stuff mm -hmm. and accurate every time, I will say. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been wrong yet. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. And that's such a gift. I mean, I know with my staff, we've got our next guest here in a minute, but oh, I yeah. know with my staff and stuff, um, I used to do personality things in our staff meetings all the time. And I did them from the framework of it, helping us understand each other, right? Just because I'm a promoter controller oh, and you are- I'm a promoter. Control. Yeah. And you're an analyzer. No. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm talking staff. Yeah. So if I'm a promoter controller and you're an analyzer supporter, there's potential for immense friction, right? Yeah. Because we don't see each other the same way. You're looking at me like, oh, will you calm down and be quiet and let's look at the data? And I'm like, will you get out of the desk and do something? Like, 
right? So we have, we have to be careful, but what you have to realize with all the different personalities and there's tons of them, mm -hmm. we all need each other. Like, especially in a staff environment or a team environment, I had, I tried to work with the team because in, in the gym industry, it's dominated by promoter supporters. But if you don't have any analyzers, yeah. you're dead in the water yeah. because you have to do follow-up. You've got to have data. You've got to have email address, phone number. You've got to follow up the numbers you've got like, right. So it's about knowing all those things. Fascinating. I love what you do. All right. Yeah. Shall Hello. we? I'm very excited. Let's yes. have we bring Ethel on. I cannot wait to meet this lady. This is going to be a lot of fun. So there she shows up magically. Hi. Ethel, hello. Hello. Smile. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Your I'm... smile is beaming. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I love Thank it. You. Thank you. Nice to be here. It's so great to have you. Well, I'm Scott and this is Laura and it's great to have you on the show, Ethel. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you both. Absolutely. So can you please, I mean, I peaked a little, but can you tell us all about yourself, what it is you do, who you are, share with the world? Okay. Well, my name is Pastor Ethel Rucker. My husband and I started a grassroots ministry over 23 years ago. I'm an author, a speaker, entrepreneur, and I'm very active in my community and helping the homeless. And then we have marriage ministry. We do financial literacy. We do all kind of relationship coaching and workshops and things like that. But my heart is just to be able to lift people. Because I came from such a background that was so dysfunctional. And then when I learned the tools and got the tools and the um, principles and to be able to turn our marriage from pain to pleasure, from pleasure mm -hmm. to passion, from passion to purpose. So this is so appropriate that it's Valentine's Day and you guys have me on. Yeah, I made sure to wear my red. <laughs> yeah. I, my favorite color. Oh, is it? Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you just finished a big course this weekend, didn't you? We did. We had a workshop. It was amazing. You know what's so powerful about the workshop? There was a couple there that was on their way to divorce court. And they said <gasps> if they had not come to this workshop, oh my and God. A, book, a book in their hand, they, were, they weren't going to make it. So we'll follow up with them. But that's what blesses my heart, is that mm. we're able to change the tra trajectory of a family, generations, and futures to come. I got goosebumps, but you can't see. <laughs> So yes, we did. It was very successful. And I'm humbled and grateful when that happens. Oh, that is so good. It's sad to see when what was once a powerful relationship just break down and come apart. Mm -hmm. And I see it a lot. I, my wife and I celebrate 30 years of marriage this summer, which we're very excited about. Um, yeah. But I think people don't realize that you have to reinvest. You can't just go, Oh, we said I do. We're good now forever. Oh man. We said so. And who cares? Like we don't have to, no, 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 because I'm not the same person you married in 1992 and you're not the same lady I married in 1992. We are very different people now. So we have to continue growing together and relearning and reinvesting in each other. So is that right? Absolutely. That was what we shared this weekend, because you're right. There's different seasons in our life. There's laws, there's promotion, there's children going to school, having babies, grandkids, all that comes into play. So we're constantly evolving. We're constantly changing. And we have to be adjustable and adapt to those different situations and talking to one another. My husband was using an illustration about when I started going through that stage of life that women go through. <laughs> and I, t I just pulled him to the side and I said, honey, it has nothing to do with you. This is all about what I'm going through, the changes. But I want you to know, I may need a little hug, more hugs right during this Aww. season, just to make him aware, because sometimes they're not, we don't educate our men. And then they're looking at us like thinking, what happened to that wonderful person that had that wonderful attitude? Now they're Miss Grumpy or whatever. So the education mm -hmm. part helped him to be able to navigate and us to go through that time. So things like that, like you're saying, growing together. Why don't they ever tell us that before we get married? <laughs> <laughs> I know, huh? That's what I love about our workshops. The singles actually pushed it. They were like, we need intervention. It yes. wasn't the married. It was the singles. So we have a single component too, which my son does an excellent job in helping people to navigate, discovering yourself, getting in the mirror and learning to love yourself, talk to yourself, assess yourself, be the best person for you, always growing and developing for you. So when you come to a marriage relationship, you bring in a, a, a whole person, a healthy person, sound person, all those kind of things. Keyword there is whole person. So many times I've heard that this person brings 50% and this person brings 50%. Together, we're 100. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, bring 100 each. 
exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, the goal is 200, not 100. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> then you're only half a person. Right. <laughs> okay. And you never should be looking for anyone to complete you either. And then sometimes my, we talk about how once you get married, then you stop doing the things that kept, you know, their attention. You just kind of get comfortable and say, well, I have them now. But no, that's not the case. You should be working on yourself all the time. A, a lifelong learner. I think John Maxwell said that. I've heard someone say that. Yeah. But we should be lifelong learners and growers and always adapting and changing. That's the way I see it. Improving. Totally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to dovetail one thing that you said, Laura, um, which is they should tell you that at the start. And and I'm curious too. Now, when my wife and I got married, we had to do, I forget how many sessions with our pastor mm -hmm. before we got married. You had We had to do this marriage counseling thing. We had yeah. to meet with them once a week for six weeks or I don't remember what it was. But I would elicit that when he taught us about all those things that we were going to go through as a married couple at the time intelligently we heard them but we weren't ready but it was like well yeah but none of that matters because we're in love yes <laughs> that attitude right that's there that's never going to happen to us right I mean, what happened what we're happened to us? because it came to a point i'll tell you full honest there was a part of our lives in maybe 15 16 years ago we might as well have been furniture in a common space, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Right. We, we just, yeah. like yeah. you said, I stopped giving my wife any attention or paying it. Like she was just furniture. Like you do the, you do the dishes and the laundry and I'll do the law. I'll mow the lawn and shovel the driveway and I'll fix the broken things. And I got my jobs and you got your jobs. You stay in your corner. I'll stay in my corner and I'm just going to work all the time. Mm -hmm. that doesn't work that's, mm -mm. That's, that's that's a death sentence exactly i agree yeah. <laughs> i was there i was there too and then it, it got even worse because then i would be that desperate one where mm -hmm. i'm like please love me please hug me <laughs> it didn't matter what i did it just turned him off more mm -hmm. and more and more Mm. Well, and in our new world with all of the things existing out there i feel like as well it's so easy to go well that person looks way more interesting than the one i'm stuck with right and, and, right and then you know there's you get people secretly going on dating apps and i I'm, i made a bad choice i'm gonna find a better choice and it's like whoa, whoa, whoa you gotta go back and reinvest in the choice you already made exactly <laughs> I think, go ahead no yeah. you go I was just thinking about um, starting our life, which I have a, a business mentor, Kyle Wilson, who was Jim Rohn's 18-year um, business partner. And we always talk about gratitude. And I believe as we stay in a place and we work hard to be grateful and find something every day to see about that, your maid, your children, the world, that's what keeps us from being, having those compete, we call them competing affections that draw mm -hmm. you away from the person that you're with, because all the time you're going to meet people that are smarter, that are more beautiful. Oh, that's always going to be there. But if we can stay practice, staying in gratitude for what we have, it just helps us to do what you were saying, <laughs> not to take each other for granted, because it's easy to do, especially after longevity, too, when you start yeah. being with someone for a long time. It's easy to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you find the connection is between the work that you do with couples and just entrepreneurs? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. The I know, loaded question. Oh yeah, it is. With mm -hmm. couples. I, I believe the connection is going back to giving people principles because I believe in principle-based life. Everything is principles. Like you were saying earlier, not being moved by our emotions, dominated mm -hmm. by them, but living a principle-based life. Entrepreneurs need to have principle, character, integrity, and work from that place as well as couples. Those principles that we teach in our book... <laughs> Are, you know, called? It's called From Misery to Marital Bliss. That's one of them. Yay. And it has the 10 principles here. But those principles are um, universal. We use them in raising our children, our business. They're universal. It talks about honesty and integrity, being able to listen attentively um, from the heart and not being judgmental or critical, creating a safe space, learning to see the end of the thing, see the end, and then back up and walk it out. All of that goes across board you know it's just not for marriage it's for anybody that will use these principles oh that has me dancing it's like you back it up and walk it out and you back it up and you <laughs> yeah, that i got yeah yeah oh i, I love yeah. this where uh, where can people find that book ethel 
Yeah. Oh, they can come to our website. It's christiandevelopment.org. Christian. christiandevelopment.org. And then they just let me know and I mail it out to them. Awesome. Yes. So I want to know, is is marriage counseling uh, between a pastor and their, I'm going to say attendees because I can't think of the word right now, mm -hmm. um, their, their ministry, is that normal in a church setting or do other... Yeah, it is normal. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, it is normal in a church setting. Um, but I would I would say you need to be careful who you get your counseling from, mm. because in a lot of church settings, especially in our culture, it's a male dominated type thing. And even in the sense of they teach the women like they're doormats and they don't have a voice. That's not that wasn't in the Bible. When we read the word, it talks mm. about mutual submission, respect and honor. So I would say I would just kind of give you uh you know little 411 make yeah. sure you who you counsel with has an understanding that you we my husband and I like put it like this if your marriage were a business would it mm. be operating in the red or the back in the business model you have to have policies procedures regulations guidelines on how this is going to operate well a lot of people don't see it that way they just said the man is the head but they don't read before that which says love your wife as christ loves the church meaning that's a lot of dying god is asking that man to do and as they love us then we're easy to come in line and get in on the same page and work as a team to move forward the good of the whole overall but that's not how it's taught a lot of times it's taught Aww. the other way where the woman doesn't have a voice and she's not supposed, no, 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 no. That's not what that Bible says. <laughs> it's a mutual respect, a mutual submission, yielding, finding out what works. Traditionally, people lock into tradition. Well, maybe I'm better at the finances. So let me do the finances. See, see what I'm saying? But if you have someone that's counseling, you just put the man in the position. Well, what if he's not good or strong at the math, the, the banking and all of that? The fine. Well, what do you do with that? You just don't give that because- Traditionally, that's what's been taught. You have to find out who's good and works best and what roles with their strengths, their weaknesses, their temperament. So. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah. it's funny too, language is huge. Submission could people used to, like back, they, they looked at submission as bow down before me and do as you're told without complaint. Well, that's not what it means. It's submission right. means look, you're better at that than I am. So I want you to do that. And I'm better at this than you are. So can you let me do that? That's It's not submission in the sense of putting a collar on a dog. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right? right. But you'd be very surprised at how much that still is prevalent in the church. Yeah. That's why I love like, why God is raising up Inrooted Love, which is our ministry, because we teach it so differently. And we're so transparent and open and down to earth where people can actually engage and ask questions and they get a whole nother perspective. Like this yeah. is what he intended for us to rule together in life and to walk side by side and walk out whatever he's given us to do. Oneness principle is what he was after. The two shall become one. Well, how do you do that? You're going to have intense fellowship, but then have guidelines and rules about how you're going to do that. And we do. We use it like a metaphor, like a boxer. When you come into the ring, because you're going to have intense fellowship, you're going to have arguments and disagreements. But how are we going to do that? We're going to touch gloves. We're going to be mutually respectful. I'm not going to be demeaning or talk over you, let you finish your sentence, not interrupt. So, so all those things. And believe me, a lot of people don't even have those life skills. Yes. <laughs> And it might seem like a strange thing to say, but in my thoughts is I want it to be, I'm going to say, use your term, a boxing match, <laughs> not in the sense of fighting, but I, I want you, I want, I love that my wife will box with me. If she doesn't, if something's not going the way she wants it, I love that she's going to say, no, no, this isn't how this is going to go. Like you said, there's rules of engagement. Mm -hmm. It's not unkind, right. but I didn't, I didn't want to marry a doormat. No, thanks. <laughs> right. Mm, I need nothing. you to stand up for yourself if I'm being a schnook because I got to learn not to be right. Exactly. Absolutely. I agree. Mm -hmm. wow. I agree. Totally. That's so, awesome. Ethel, I want to know, cause you had mentioned earlier that you and your husband both teach this program. Mm -hmm. I want to know what that relationship looks like while teaching. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so how does funny. that stand out? 
It's actually just, and I love the fact that I have, we have the male perspective. I love the male perspective because mm. I grew up without a father figure in my home. So I didn't even know how to respect men. God had to teach me how to do all of that. The submission, the respect, the honor. I had to learn that from him, from the word. And so when we're, di when we're in our workshops, they get to hear my side and they get to hear his side, which mm -hmm. I believe brings the balance. Yes. Because men are wired differently. They think differently. And I love it. And I'm always like, I love the male energy. I love the interaction. I love my ladies too, but I just love it because they bring a different perspective. And if we listen and hear, then things can go a little, a lot more smoother. So he's, and he's very comical. He's funny. He doesn't even know it, but he's very comical, but he's very down to earth and transparent. And then men get to see the softer side of men. He tells them in our workshops how he didn't know how to communicate. He said, how do you communicate something when you haven't been taught how to communicate? Mm -hmm. So he had to learn how to communicate. He didn't know how to tell me, I don't like when you burn the cornbread. <laughs> he would just sulk or whatever and shut down. Uh -huh. He was communicating that way, but with words. So, so when they hear that, that gives them, oh, it's okay to say that. It's okay to let my wife know. But you also have to create, which I teach women, you have to create a safe place for our men so they can come and be able to trust us with their innermost feelings that they know that we won't go get on the phone and talk to our girlfriends and spread it, but they can we create a safe haven for them to just be themselves. With all they deal with out there, they used to come home and know that I'm on the same team with you. So that's what we do. We bounce off of each other. He shares his perspective and I share mine. And we, it's a oneness thing that we, we're teaching uh -huh. and they see it lived out before them. 38 years later, we'll be 39 years this year. Aww. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. It's so actually much. like a little pop because it's only been 23 this year. 23 still years. Good. It's still amazing. <laughs> still amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm just older than you, Laura. What? I'm just older than you is all. Oh, I know. I know. I was 14 when my husband what? and I got together. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, there's been a lot of changes both with our personalities and just all of the life milestones that happen and something like the work that you do is so powerful in all of those stages. I realized that I'm really and truly still with my first boyfriend. Wow. Yeah. Blessing. Like I That's dated you. one guy, I didn't know his name. <laughs> he knew, he knew that I only wanted to date him to make the guy that I liked jealous. He knew oh. and he, he was okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't actually count him as a boyfriend. It was elementary school. Yeah. But like to, to have these conversations at those milestones, mm -hmm. even if it's like little bits to say, this is what's coming next. You might want a heads up would have been wonderful. Yes, yeah. exactly. And that's what I love about the singles um, wanting us to do this because it's like, at least you'll have a point of reference. We went through the fire. We had to be tested, <laughs> tried and proven to be able to come up with these principles. You don't have to go through as much if you just take them and start applying them to your life. We kind of already went through it so we can help you, like you said, during those times. But it's not anything to be afraid of. You know that we went through it. We made it through it. And now we're best friends, partners, working in ministry, helping our homeless. We work with our city mayor and all that kind of stuff. We're very involved, but we're the best friends. And I wanted that. I wanted a guy that would want to know Ethel, be a friend with her. What are her aspirations, her dreams, her fears, her inhibitions, and not just want me for it back in the day, what I looked like <laughs> with the little 24 inch yeah. waist line. <laughs> had all of that. I didn't, I wanted more, wanted him to want me for more than just that. You know? Yeah. Are you awesome. willing to share just a little bit about the fire that you had just mentioned that you got through? Oh yeah. This okay. book was, yeah. This book was forged because as I said earlier, I came from a very dysfunctional background. My father left when I was five. My husband didn't have a father figure. My mom asked me to leave her house at gunpoint, she had some issues going on with her issues, you know, mm -hmm. and so I didn't have anywhere to go. I went to my father. My father was with uh, his new wife and they didn't want me there. So a church person and took me into, so that was my, what do you call it, ram in the bush. And Aww. from that time, my husband and I, we got married. I didn't have the tools. We say you can get married and love each other, but then you need tools in order to navigate. I didn't have those. So these principles came out of me getting into my time and praying and asking God, I know you didn't mean for me to live my life like this. And he began to download. You're right, I didn't, but you have to choose. You have to make a change to grow, ch a choice to grow, to change, and to do better. And so I have to stop doing a lot of things like talking down to him, 
help talking, getting on the phone and talking to him, my friends about him in a negative light, learning how to honor him, learning how to respect him, learning how to build him with my words instead of tearing him down and becoming his friend, developing that friendship. And like I was saying, of creating a home where he can come home and know that he can trust this person as his partner, his friend, his ride or die. And so I had to do a lot of developing because I was emotional like a little girl, you know, acting all crazy. <laughs> and then I had to grow up and mature to become the woman that I am today through those times, those hard times, those hard places. And he, he himself too, because he didn't know how to relate. I didn't know how to relate to him. He didn't know how to relate to me. And we had to learn how to communicate effectively and non-threatening and all that kind of stuff. So. And in our Af in our African American community, a lot of our ladies don't have father figures, and so not having that, you don't know how to relate to men in the right way. And I had to learn how to relate to men the right way, and God taught me that as I spent time with Him. Mm -hmm. have to break that cycle. That's so powerful. I love that you and your husband teach together too, because I mean, mm -hmm. newsflash: men and women are different. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew, right? We communicate very differently and mm -hmm. different things matter to each of us, right? Yes. Or you know, the I guess can you say men and women anymore? I still I still do, but uh <laughs> masculine mm -hmm. and feminine, let's do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's such a great, powerful gift. Have you are there other people like Mark Gungor, I think is uh, is his name. Is he's he's a fun guy that we've listened to. We've listened to his his marriage stuff, and he's got some real neat pieces along that line too, like how men and women are different and how we um, play together. Right. What are your thoughts on that side of the fence? Oh, I love Mark. I, I listen to him too. And there's another guy, I think it's Tony Evans. Okay. You heard of Tony Evans? I have not. Okay. Yeah. My thing is I love all of them, but what I do is uh, for me, I think that our, when I look out and when I was looking out to get help, and I, I, I um, came across Stormy O. Martin. I don't know if you heard of her, the praying wife like that and other people. I didn't see a lot of us. And so I'm mm -hmm. grateful that I wanted to go through the process so that now I can take the tools that God taught us because there are unique challenges in the African-American community. Mm -hmm. A lot of us did not grow up with fathers, mm -hmm. males and females. So what does that do? It deals with your identity your self-esteem, your self-worth and all of that. So I ask God <laughs> to raise us up and help us to be an example so that when we see us, oh, they did it. They came from, you know, all that brokenness, all that dysfunction. I mean, it was a really hostile environment that I grew up in to turn your life around and take principles and become a better person. And then you can have what we call the white picket fence, the house, because like, that's what I grew up on, right? <laughs> and so we can have it too. So um, I love them. I take information from them and implement it too, because the principles are universal. Mm -hmm. universal. So I love him. I would say human beings are universal. Okay. <laughs> love, right? <laughs> We're all just folks, which is, but that's it's so amazing because yeah, each specific environment. I mean, I grew up in Northern Canada, which is different than Southern Alabama. Like we're all different, you know, there's, there's nuances, but there's common threads that, mutual respect and, and caring for each other that they're, they're just common across just everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's so fantastic. Thank so you. what are some of the best ways people can work with you? Like, is it always in person or can it be online? Do you have a video series or how can people work with you? We don't have a video series, but I don't mind um, doing Zoom. <laughs> like we're doing Zoom calls and things like that we've done. We do do it in person and then, um, Basically, that's pretty much what we do right now in person. If they like to do a Zoom consultation, we can do it that way, work out something that way. Oh, no, that's cool. Mm -hmm. And where are you based out of? I think I read it, Ethel, but I've forgotten. Oh, we're in Southern California. Are you familiar <laughs> with Los Angeles, the Rams? <laughs> we do, yeah. We're 30 miles east of uh, LA. So we're okay. in the Indian Empire. Mm -hmm. Nice, beautiful Thank place you. out there. It is. Where are you guys from? I'm from the east coast of Canada, so oh. I'm in Nova Scotia. Oh, and nice. gro West. Growing up here is not the same as northern Canada. Mm. We're very much like a lot of retired people, a lot of old school thinking, a lot of hospitality and family. So if you take the niceness of Canada and you just amplify it oh, wow. <laughs> but with older people, oh, that's about okay. what it is here. 
I'd yeah. love to visit Canada. I heard it was beautiful there. I love it's pretty it. cool. Yeah. It's um and so I'm uh I'm in Alberta, I'm middle of Alberta. So you go from Montana straight up about 10 hours, you kind of get to me. So okay. Yeah, it's awesome. And I grew up way in northern BC, way up in the north country, boomtown, oil and gas, feast or famine, a lot mm -hmm. of uh a lot of interesting things as a kid. Um yeah. <laughs> so Ethel, yes. where do you find most people trip up? Before, like before they come to you, there's usually something that snaps where they say enough is enough. What does that moment look like? <laughs> before they get to us, let yeah. me see. that's a good question. Before they get to us, usually they've gone through. I'm sorry, can you guys hear that? Um, the, in the back, okay. <laughs> I apologize. Before they get to us, usually they've exhausted all their means and they're at the breaking point of like, this is it. I can't take it anymore. Um, I'm done. And that's when we, it, they come to us. It's almost like their last resort, which is to me is kind of backwards. But yeah. in our community, a lot of times, you know, people don't want to show their weaknesses mm -hmm. and they don't want you to know that they're having struggles. So it's really at the lat when they just can't take it anymore. Like the, the workshop, they're on the verge of on divorce and now they want. And it's like, you should have been seeking out help when you start having struggles along the way, like when you're sick, you don't wait until hopefully, you know what I'm saying? You start going to the doctor because you saw signs in your relationship or your body is saying, speaking to you. But people wait until it's like in desperate times and then they come to us. Mm. But we're able because we're so even though we're pastors, we're so transparent. We don't we're not religious. We're relational. There's right. a difference. And so there we is. meet people where we meet people where they where they where they are and take them from there to where they want to be. And if they really will listen and apply what we're saying, because they're principles, like I said, it's not about religion. Take the principles, apply the principles, you will get results. Mm -hmm. So they come to us in desperate times. There's a mm -hmm. lot that I learned from all sorts of religions, because I'm I'm not religious, mm -hmm. but I still love learning from all all of the places. Yes. Sometimes it's the same lessons worded differently and sometimes they're different lessons. Mm -hmm. But as I was mentioning to Scott earlier, I love these different perspectives because then I get a clearer picture of what people are trying to say and find ways for me to understand it and implement it into my life. Absolutely. What, what, is, what is one thing you feel everybody needs to know to no matter where they are in the relationship to elevate their relationship. Hmm. Well, I will say the one thing would be is to love yourself. <laughs> that will language. <laughs> if you love yourself. Uh, when you love yourself, then you know how to love and give that love to others. When you don't love yourself, it's hard to give what you don't have. So I would say if you love yourself in a healthy way, that's powerful. You can build anything from that place if you really know how to love you. That's what I would say. Now, I want to deep dive into that. This is yeah. fantastic. So I want to share just a quick bit. I still remember the moment in my life when I heard that that was possible mm -hmm. to love yourself. I was in college and I was on a ski trip with my now wife. We were dating and we were on a bus, a college bus trip to go skiing. And my wife were separated in a room. We were chatting because we were dating at the time. And her sister was in the next room. So we were in, we were in a hotel room and my wife had said, Oh, I love three people in this room. And I looked at her and said, what are you talking about? There's only three people here. She goes, Yeah. I love you. I love my sister and I love myself. And I said, you can't love yourself. That's ridiculous. And she looked at me and she said, of course you can love yourself. Don't you? I'm like, no, I'm a loser. I hate myself. If I could be better, like I, I can't stand myself. Like all of my troubles are because I'm such a loser. Right. And she was like, um, she was speechless. And that was the moment in time when I realized loving yourself was an option. I, and I was 19 and I it did not occur to me that was possible to love yourself. 
Mm. And so thus began a process of learning to love myself. And I still remember 10 years later mm. being in a personal development course. And one of the assignments was I had to go home and look in the mirror and say to myself, I had to say my name to myself, mm -hmm. I love you. And I felt like I was vomiting an apple whole. <laughs> I couldn't say it. I didn't believe it. It was impossible. So, and, and even now I'm, I'm 53 this year. I'm like, do you love yourself? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Wow. But you know, it's still a little tender, but yes, yeah. I'm there. But what would you say to somebody who's that 19 year old version of me who just is like, love yourself. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. What do you say to them? Because it's critical. It, it is. I know like you, because I grew up in so much dysfunction and my mom told me I was the ugliest child that she ever had. And I never was going to mount anything. I was never going to be anything. Again, my relationship with God, because I have a relationship, a personal yes. one. Yeah? In my time of prayer, he said to take a five by eight index card, write out every scripture that talks about how you wonderfully and wonderfully made. You are royalty. You are precious in my sight. And you put them in, on the mirror in the bathroom. You put them by your nightstand at night and you put them in your car and you say this to yourself until you believe it and you uproot all of those seeds of negativity that has been spoken into your life. And that's what I had to do. And I would say that to someone that's feeling that way, the same thing, put their name like you did and say, I'm beautiful. I accept myself. I love me, whatever you want to say until you begin to believe it. Cause it is a process. I had to do that. So I believe it now. I know I love myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. If you, you know, I'm like, I'm good. If you don't, I love me. I know that I'm always going to be in a place of working and growing and develop. It's not arrogant. It's not prideful. And people think that sometimes it's not because you have to truly love yourself because when you love yourself, there's, you're going to put standards in your life. There's things you're going to accept and not accept. If you don't know that, that's, I believe that's why abuse and stuff takes place because people don't love themselves. So they allow things to be said and done to them because they don't know how to love themselves. Yeah, so absolutely. I would encourage them to spend time like you and I did right now. I love me. I accept me. I'm worthy of love. Whatever you want to say to get that out, up out of you and build, pour, pour into yourself, your value, your self-love. And I think that's important. You really nailed it, Ethel, in the sense that it's a process because yes. when we're children, especially like, you know, your, your background, you know, my background, we don't really know them, but, you know, I'll say that I grew up in a, environment that wasn't so beneficial we'll say um and when you're a child you're all your your brain's just on record mm -hmm. it doesn't filter anything it just it just records okay you're useless you're a loser nobody likes you shut up get out of here you did that wrong i'm gonna beat you up like your brain just records i have no value i'm a loser and that becomes not hardwired but strong wired mm -hmm. and then later as an adult I think it's important to understand that it takes time to unlearn that stuff because Absolutely. once we're past seven, eight years old, we're not on pure record anymore. Right. We're on filter and it's, it's so it, it requires patience mm -hmm. to come to that. Yeah. Cause like you, when I first started saying it, I would cringe. I, was like, yeah. I, would, say, I would, I'd be in the mirror and I'd say, you're beautiful. Ooh. <laughs> I didn't believe it. I was like, ooh. You know, and there's like, another voice going, no, you aren't. Right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, like, I have to do that until, you know, finally, eventually you keep saying it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. So I began to believe it as I kept saying it, but I had to keep saying it, keep saying it. Keep saying it. Yeah. One of my mentors had a great way to work with sentences like that, where you try to speak truths that you want to, to have, but yet you cringe. She's like, Put at the beginning of those sentences, I'd like to think that mm. I'm beautiful. I'd like to think that I'm smart. And I was like, then you don't have that gut reaction because that is now true. Yes. And we can build on that. And I was like, oh. So I started it. Yeah. <laughs> I actually put like a physical anchor mm -hmm. to my body where every time, like I, I 
practice mindfulness and do meditation stuff. So I have one hand on my, my gut mm -hmm. and one hand on my heart. So now touching my heart, I've made that mean I love me. So now every time I do it or every time I tap, it means I love me. And I just get all the feels. It's like, yay, I feel oh, love. I love that. I'll I also take that don't remember. Yeah, I love me. Mm -hmm. I don't remember where I heard this one, though. And it was something about when we are born or created, it required love to create you. So you are made with love, of love. It's like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so simple but so true i am made of love you are made of love you are made of love every day all day mm -hmm. i love it <laughs> I that's love awesome it. i've heard a similar thing too laura where it's i'm in the process of or i'm improving at Ooh. right i'm improving at loving myself because that can't be our, like i love myself no you don't right now you're just arguing, right? Like, I'm in the process of learning to love myself. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, I can see that. Like there's the, the argument's gone and it, it just becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. I love um, so much of what you do, Ethel. Thank what you. are some big takeaway things you'd want to just make sure? We've got, you know, kind of eight, nine minutes left. Um, what else can we bring to this table that just really, there's somebody out there listening that's just on the verge of going, okay, I think I know what they're talking about. How can we really connect? Mm. Well, like I, this whole um, time that we've been together, the key word that seems to have been the theme is really learning to love yourself, accept mm -hmm. yourself, value yourself. So I really want to encourage people because I know in our culture, there's so much going on in these days and times that people compare themselves to the people on TV, the celebrities and all of that, that we really need to take time to take just be with ourselves. Um, get reacquainted with who we are. And like Laura just said, we have to know that we can touch our heart right here and say mm -hmm. and remind ourselves that we were made from love, that we're important, and that we can be vessels and conduits of love. And I really try to focus on that. As I love myself, I want to give that love out. And I would, I would um, encourage them to start trying to, once they start here, giving. Because as you give, guess what? It grows. And you shift your focus from yourself and what you're dealing with with what other people and let that love flow through you to touch someone else's life. You'd be amazed the miracles and the things that come into your life just from being a conduit and a person that wants to give love and add love to other people's lives. So. Mm. I've noticed a huge shift in my relationship I, I had mentioned earlier about the trying everything and being desperate for his love before. Mm -hmm. What what switched things for me was learning to love myself. All the whole incomplete version of me. Yes. And I remember that moment where I was like, I am choosing me. And if that means that he no longer loves me because I've chosen me, so be it. If that means he's willing to step up to this new version of me that I have created, mm -hmm. so be it. Mm. And it was from that moment on of choosing me every time that our relationship has, it's the best now that it has been in <laughs> at least 10 years. And it just keeps getting better. So mm -hmm. everything you're saying, Ethel, is 100% right. Thank you. Yeah. We have a comment that came in that somebody said wow. um, a few different things. Um, we need to invest even more when we both come from broken, adverse childhood mm -hmm. experiences. And one of the things she said that I love, and it dovetails something on, that you said, Ethel, she says, I've been married for over 30 years, but it's not all warm fuzzies. You mentioned about what we see in society, when we see on TV and stuff. Um, you know, nobody puts a Facebook status that says, my wife is such a jerk and we had a big fight and she's a horrible. No, they just post, oh, look at us smiling. Right, like, right. Look at our wonderfulness. And so you just see everybody's post there and you're sitting there thinking, well, everybody's life is wonderful and perfect. It's just me. Right. I guess we're the only right. ones struggling. So that's true. That's, that's just not it. It's not. In fact, it's probably the opposite. 90% of us are struggling and only 10% maybe, you know, are all this. But it's all a part of the real being real. And we, we don't, we're not real anymore. Everybody's trying to paint these images of happiness and all that. That's what I love about what we do. But in Rooted Love is because we are so transparent 
and down to earth and we talk about our struggles and what we have to overcome and the dysfunction. It, it doesn't bring shame to us. It shows where no matter where you start in life, you don't have to end there. Mm-hmm. When you can start, your, your start may be rocky, but where you land <laughs> is up to you. And you have that choice. And that's what God told me. He said, you have to choose. I gave you everything. Now you choose, make a choice. I do believe life is choice driven and we live and die by the choices we make. We have to take personal responsibility. It doesn't matter what environment we were raised or born in. We still have to take personal responsibility to become a better person. Mm -hmm. I believe that. So. Where you go from here is up to you. And all of those challenges and trials and tribulations built strength because you're still here. Yes. Right? Yes. I love that image. Because if, if we both show up at 100%, then we have 200% strength in this relationship, which will, every time we hit one of those milestones, those obstacles, we now come at that with double the amount of strength <laughs> what we would have if we only showed up at half so Mm -hmm. even though i have my trauma and my husband has his trauma and we're still working through it in our own ways yes the more we work on ourselves the closer knit we can become and once we have that fabric in place that's the strength that's going to help us over all of these because life is just going to keep doing this absolutely <laughs> and we have to to gain that strength just like an exercise it's a muscle we have to use it absolutely, yeah. oh. absolutely. I, absolutely. I think in pictures so i play movies in my head every time we talk i love it that's funny because i just got a text from our workshop and they were saying your life should be a movie and i agree with it because yes. it just needs to be someone can still learn from all the principles and seeing how it turned into a love relationship. You know, we like to know, so, you know, at the end of the thing, it's, it's, it's working They're They are happy. They're still working on each other, like you said, but then the beauty of what it started and what it looks like now. And I said, I totally agree with you. So, so I want to know what the, some of those pieces look like when people are doing it right. Mm-hmm. How do we know we're doing it right? Can you give us just a few examples of what that looks like? When people are doing their relationship right, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, they that definitely, like I said, when you're doing it right, you your friends. You see a friendship. You see a oneness. You see a respect to each other. You see the give and take. You see future planning goals together, honoring one another. When they're doing it right, it doesn't mean that they won't have differences of opinions and arguments, and but still, in how we do that, how we care for one another, how we walk through life, how we show up how we support one another. Like you said, 100%, 100%. When you're not at 100, I'm 100 today. You may be not at 100 tomorrow, but I'll be there. So we kind of are constantly mm-hmm. coming together to move forth this relationship. So that you see friendship is built on friendship. It's built on trust. It's built on honesty and openness, all that transparency. That's when they're doing it right. And they accept each other's weaknesses. They're not trying to change each other. We, My husband and I have this um, slogan that we say, we're not tolerating one another. We are truly celebrating one another. We're not in competition with each other. You know, so when they're doing it right, they show up as friends, partners, lovers, all that good stuff. <laughs> Everything you said just right there is exactly how we amplify our message. Mm-hmm. It's like we are creating those friendships, those loving relationships that, that sharing and especially the celebration. Yes. Like when I yeah. I think too when a relationship is broken, like we said earlier, when when you think it's 50-50, so one person's giving 50%, and the other person's giving 50%, and like, well, I'm not gonna give 60, you're only giving 50. Oh, that's, that's when you when you both agree to give a hundred, there's space for you know, today you're at 50 because a bunch of stuff going on. Fine, I'm gonna be 150 today because you need me. Because together we still need to be, we need to be 200. Yes. And so if you're only 50 today, great. I'll be 150 because I'll tell you next week, I'm going to be 50. You be 150. I think that's the dance. Mm -hmm. That is. I agree. Totally. Ethel in our last minute here. um, Is there anything like, do you have a course coming up? People should know about, or with your book, is it, is it, is it free? There's a cost or how do we, how do people benefit from your amazing skills? Well, this book right here is only actually five dollars now <laughs> it used to be i know it used to be you know 10 but as years go on we adjusted it so they can get this book it's 30 years of wisdom in it 
but it's so small. It's you so put it, cute. I love it. <laughs> and you put it wherever and you just, I need that principle today. So they can go online, like I said earlier, at christiandevelopment.org and we send it out to them. This one, I have another one. That I did. There's a chapter in this one. It's a number. They can get this one on Amazon. Ooh. Purpose, Passion, and Profit. My mentor, Kyle Wilson, asked me to do a chapter in it on my marriage and relationship, along with all these other amazing people. There's some amazing people on here that I would never be able to be close and personal to unless it was before my mentor connecting us. So they can get that one, Purpose, Passion, and Profit on Amazon.com. Nice. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Any last words to share? I just want people to really understand that, like you said, it is a dance. It is a relationship. And we need to um, really understand it's going to be work because anything worthwhile, you have to invest in it and work hard at it. But if you really value and respect your mate, your spouse, your children, whoever, whatever relationship you may be in, and you learn to communicate with them effectively and be open to listen and just um, work together as a team, you'll be okay. And just keep moving forward. Don't give up. Don't quit. If you need help, outside help counseling, find it. Mm -hmm. Get it. Don't ever run, run away from that because I encourage it. Just make sure it's good counseling for you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. wow. Thank it you guys. Such Thank a delight you. having you on. And I really appreciate you sharing some of those, those fires that you have been through. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I love it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank so you. So wonderful. Me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ethel. It's been just a treat to get to know you. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank you for having me and blessings to you all. Happy Love Day. Oh, yes. You too. Awesome. Have Happy a great love day. day too. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, that has been fantastic. Yeah. I think we have about 15 minutes, or I guess 12 minutes to chat it out before we close up, I think. Oh, cool. That's I didn't important. know if we were going to keep chatting or just like, well, I guess we're all out of guests. Let's go. But if we're going to keep it up, wrap it up, that would be fantastic. That would be fantastic. I do call it love day. I want to start there because to me, it's not about the marriage. It's not about the relationship. It's, it's about singles. It's about self-love. It's about loving your pets. It's about loving your job and the work that you do. Just love in general. Mm -hmm. Which is why I have a heart in my branding. <laughs> it's like, it's yes. all, it's all about love. And how you make, totally. how you feel and how you show up in that place. Yeah. Well, and of course, in my world of fitness and nutrition, I have people that are, you know, they're working on trying to be healthy and, and fit. And, and most people are working on dropping body fat. So they, they look at love day, Valentine's day as stressful yeah. because, yes. because there's chocolates and cupcakes and candies and, and all these kinds of things. And I think it's really important to remember that Valentine's day is not about food. It's about people. It's about connection. Like you said, whether it's your pet or your children or your spouse or your relatives or call your mom. <laughs> yes. I should call my mom. I know I got to call mine too. You know, so it's about so much more than, than that. It's mm -hmm. it, food is neat. It's an accent to it, but it's not, I love that the day is about people. Yes. Oh, so now I want to go back through my notes. Mm. I want to know some of your insights you've had over the last four hours yeah. <laughs> doing this. Amazing. Um, okay. So it's been really great. I mean, we had Patrick Verano in the beginning. Mm. He spoke to me. I took tons and tons of notes with Patrick it was so good. Um, you know, lead like no other. He had some really, really great points i loved his cable analogy the golden yes. gate bridge like the cable made up of so many strands that makes it strong and even if one strand starts to fail you're okay you got to do some maintenance but it's going to be strong i really like that a lot um i like he when so he said um hr instead of human resources is human relationships yes that was like mind-blowing to me why don't they yes. just call it that i know because a resource is like like staples for the stapler yeah that's not so robust yeah, human relationships human so relationships. much better <laughs> what would you get anything from patrick what is your thoughts there oh um just so much he was he was talking about resilience and well-being and vulnerability and how being a leader needing all of these things it's the same as being an entrepreneur we mm -hmm. still need these skills to be who we are in whatever business we're at. We just need to elevate them since that's the word, amplify them. 
Yeah. To become a leader. So yes. we have that identity. We just need to grow it. Mm -hmm. And we can grow it. I, uh. <laughs> yeah, that was there was some really good stuff there. And I know um Corey's going to have this is recorded. So yeah. this will be put out for viewing later, which is great. So yeah, for people that missed Patrick, I mean, I highly recommend you go back and, and mm. check that one out. And then we had Charmaine Hammond on next and she was yeah. just so amazing. She had so much insight as well. What are your top giveaways from, from Charmaine? I'm pretty sure her and I have been chatting on LinkedIn before, and I just didn't know that it was her. Oh, Names cool. are not my forte, so I apologize to people, but faces are. So as soon as I yeah. see a face, I'll be like, I know that person. Yeah. I'm pretty sure her conversations about sponsorships and how to connect with people. I think we had that conversation a few times on LinkedIn a few months ago, but I, I loved that we spent most of the time talking about sponsorships because that really is the pain point in most of our messaging. Mm -hmm. It's like, what value are we bringing to people instead of going, you, you should give me money and I'll put your logo on my bus. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> Stupid logo on a bus. We, we talk it up like it's this great valuable thing. And they're like, Pfft. yeah. Yeah. It, I guess it's the conversions. It's not, they don't want attention. They want conversions. Yeah. And when we think of advertising them, we think of giving them attention. Right. Yeah. And if we tie that to re the relationships that we just did, it's not the attention that we want. It's the connection that comes with the attention mm -hmm. that we want. Yeah. They want a powerful testimonial that connects other people rather than yeah. just a logo. That was huge. That was huge. And you know what? I loved one of the things that you said during that interview, which is, you know, you make a connection on LinkedIn or whatever. And it's just like, hi, I'm Scott. Will you marry me? <laughs> that cracked me up, but it's so true. I've yeah. done that before. All of my sponsorship letters to companies were basically that I'm Scott. I'm wonderful. I want to marry you. And they're like, no, thanks. Yeah. I have to ask you this. How many random DMS do you get on all of your social media platforms that tend to run in about four different copies? Oh yeah. Hi. In Phil name, Scott, I was looking at your profile and I loved your work. <laughs> I think it would be wonderful for us to work together. Here's what I do. Here's my website. Love whomever. <laughs> yeah. You're into health and fitness. Boy, I really want to talk to you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, I have this. Oh, here we go. Multi-level marketing. All right. <laughs> And it's not that that's necessarily bad, but it's just no. like, you could, you could see it's, it's like, hi, this is my name. Want to get married. Whoa. Cool. Yes. Your jets. <laughs> but Charmaine, yeah. she pointed it out like in, in that text, in order to make the other person feel seen and heard and understood, which is what we want as human beings, mm -hmm. highlight something specific about them yes that shows you did your research and didn't just copy paste something that some guru or expert told you to copy paste right with somebody's name yeah get totally. personal that was yeah that was so fantastic uh and then of course we had ethel on well i guess we had me and then we had you yes. which is fun let's talk about you <laughs> oh okay <laughs> <laughs> no no i am loving this i i've heard your story before but I didn't hear some of the deeper parts of that. Mm. Like I knew that you were into fitness. I knew that you were in a bike accident. I knew that you were in architecture, but I didn't piece it all together like I did today. So it just, it felt like all of these random pieces mm. of you. Whereas today I actually feel like I got to know you a little more. And I really liked that you let me read your eyes. <laughs> that was really neat. <laughs> Live on, on screen, yeah. Yeah, I thought that was, I really enjoyed that. And, and I'm the same. I mean, you know, I knew bits and pieces of you before, and I really enjoyed really completing the picture and understanding more about what you're up to and, and what you do, which is, mm -hmm. that's part of the gifts of these things. And it was interesting. You were talking about reading a whole book is it's a lot. And I, and I think that's why podcasts have become so popular because it's manageable sound bites. Yes. Right. I used to listen to podcasts when I worked in architecture. Yeah. And this was before podcasts were super popular. Yeah. I was just like, I can learn these webinar style things while I'm drawing pictures. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it while I was writing notes because 
I did right. that once and I made a hundred thousand dollar mistake. Copy pasted nice. a note, forgot to edit it. <laughs> the wrong supply was ordered. Oops. Oh, things happen. But yeah, yeah, podcasting was huge. And now everybody else is getting onto the podcast bandwagon and there's so much information out there. Mm -hmm. You have a podcast, don't you? No, I don't. Um, I, I built the podcast room because I've been interviewed on podcasts since the documentary was done and people have been asking to interview me, which, so I built this room for that purpose. But I also, I had a one month stint on an online radio. I was a DJ on a radio station for a month. Yeah. Right. Playing I music. I need to know now. Well, that was part of the deal that became a bit of a fail point. It was supposed to be 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s music. And then we got a young manager of the station came in and he was playing all this stuff from the 2000s, 2010s that I had never heard of, don't like, didn't want to hear. And it, it was just a misalignment, right? I got into the station because it was going to play the music I knew, love, and wanted to talk about. And it ended up being music that was not my jam. And I learned a few things. I picked up a few songs here and there, but it was really, really repetitive music that I didn't love. And I was like, mm, you know, this is fun, but this is also not what I'm up to. My passion is to help people be fit and healthy and vibrant. And this is not that. And so I let it go, but I built the room for it, which allows me to make my daily mindset videos for my clients to sound good. That sounds wonderful. I have a chair with a closet. <laughs> Well, sound panels yeah yeah get some sound panels and glue them to the walls and you're off and running well i can't glue sound panels to somebody else's condo building oh <laughs> not me. your condo building yes that's true yes but it was it was great knowing how you've pivoted or mm -hmm. shifted in the last two years i had no idea i knew it was kind of up in the air so 100 to pivot. hear where you're going because then yeah. i know how to show you out to other people Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And same, I have good clients of mine. I'm like, oh, I know who I got to get her in touch with Laura. Well, she's not an entrepreneur, but yeah. So that's fun too. It's more of a mindset. I'll kind of, I'll be open to having other conversations, but oh, I want cool. the people who are in business who want to sell something that's the, theirs. Right. Usually through their story. So yeah. 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 And then yes. Ethel, she was yes. really fantastic. <sighs> Loved chatting with her. And just, I wrote this one in caps. Love yourself. Yes. Then you'll be able to love others. Yeah. That feels like just the huge topic of the hour right there. Yeah. And on a perfect day, like love day. And I love that we got to explore that one because, you know, from my experience, it's like, I've heard love yourself, but if you don't, it seems absurd. And how? How do you, where do you start? I don't know. Okay. Love yourself. Great. I understand. It's probably a good idea, but I don't. So now what? Hmm. Because you, it's not a switch you can turn on. No. It's broken <laughs> stuff from the past. So it's a process. And I think understanding that it's a process that requires patience about learning to love yourself and realize that you were made from love. You come from love and, and, and God moved through you with love and all of that. And, and really realizing all of the pieces you do have is a process. So, and I, you know, we're down to our last minute and my dog alarm just went off saying my next client is coming up, but uh, okay. I'm, I'm really excited about tomorrow. We've got Kelly Fallardo coming first thing in the morning tomorrow. And mm. she's phenomenal for self-publishing and guiding people to get the number one on Amazon. We've got yeah. Joe Valley, who's legendary. Mm -hmm. which is awesome. We've got Amy Novotny. We've got Mickey James uh, Elson and uh, Jan K. Crystal. We've got so many great guests tomorrow. It's going to be another powerful day full of learning. Anything to add before we sign off? Um, I do have a very short story. I remember the moment that I realized I loved myself. And it, mm. I didn't even know it was coming. I stood on the scale one day. I looked at the number. And instead of going, Ugh, or any of the gut reactions we had, the first thing that came to my mind was, oh, you dear sweet child, the things that I have done to you and oh. you are still here for me. And then I went, wait, is this what self-love feels like? Yes. <laughs> you know, one so of happy the things love day. I can't wait to see you tomorrow. Yeah. And I want to say, I want to dovetail onto that. One of the things I tell my clients all the time is your body loves you. Yes. Love your body right now is doing everything it can to help you be vibrant. Please stop feeding it garbage. 
it's the only you're, thing that is always you're not there. helping. Yeah. yeah. It needs you to feed it good food and good energy and good thoughts because then it will thrive. Good. I awesome. end by saying much love, everyone. Can't wait to see you tomorrow. We have yeah. an incredible lineup. Oh, I can't wait to see where it goes. Woohoo! Woo Fantastic. Hey, <laughs> all the love. Bye, love. You can press the, the end button. I'm going to push yeah. the button. I'm going. Oh, do you have the button? Oh, I just leave. <laughs>